Okay, good afternoon and welcome to today's planning committee. This is not a public meeting, but a meeting the public can attend. I'm Councillor Susan Durant, Chair of Planning Committee. The members of the Planning Committee present today are the Vice Chair, Councillor Sue McGuinness, Councillor Duncan Anderson, Iris Beach, Mick Cooper, Eve Cox, John Healy, Shelley Hogarth, Eva Hughes, Andy Pickering and Jonathan Wood. I will now ask the committee members to introduce themselves in alphabetical order to ensure that they are in attendance and can hear proceedings. Can I ask that when you are not speaking, please keep your microphone on mute. Councillor McGuinness. Afternoon, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Anderson. Good afternoon, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Beach. Afternoon, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Cooper. Nice to see you, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Cox. Present, Miss. Thank you, Councillor Hughes. I'm present, Chair. Good morning. Thank you. Councillor Healy. On behalf of Councillor Healy, Chair, he did let me know that he's going to be late. He's taking his wife to hospital, so he will be joining us shortly, but it just might be half past two or something like that. OK, thank you. That Councillor Hogarth. Good, uh, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Pickering. Present, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Wood. Yes, Chair. Thank you. We have a number of Doncaster Council officers in attendance who will be supporting the meeting. We have Roy Sites, Head of Planning, Gary Hildersley, Planning Development Manager, sorry, uh, Planning Case Officers Nicola Elliott, Andrea Sudders, who are Principal Planning Officers, Jacob George and Mark Ramsey, who are Senior Planning Officers. We also have Stacey Cutler, the Senior Legal Officer, Daniel Atkinson, Tree and Hedgerow Officer, Geraldine Amis Porter, Senior Pollution Officer, Amber Torrington and David Taylor, Governance Services. We've also got uh, Steve Shannon and Martin Eli that are available for the meeting as well. Sure, I think we've got John, John Tesh as well, Jonathan Tesh. Oh, we've got Jonathan as well, thank you. In respect of application two, we have Kate Hay, a local resident, and Jim Lowe, DLP consultant acting as agent. In respect of application three, we've got councillor Nick Allen, ward member, Mr. Phil Midgley, local resident, Mr. David Rowe, agent from Building Link Design. In respect of application four, we have Mr. Michael Green, a local resident. I will now ask the other attendees to introduce themselves to ensure that they are in attendance and can here proceedings. Roy? Good afternoon, Chair. Thank you. Gary? Gary, Gary isn't here. He's on leave, uh, Chair, so I'll be uh, filling those boots. All right, thank you. Nicola? Here, Chair. Thank you. Andrea? Present, Chair. Thank you. Jacob? Here, Chair. Thank you. Mark? Yes, here, Chair. Thank you. Stacey? Here, Chair. Thank you. Daniel? Here, Chair. Thank you. Geraldine? Present, Chair. Thank you. Amber? Present, Chair. David? Present, Chair. Steve? Present, Chair. Martin? Eli? Present, Chair. Jonathan Tash? Uh, present, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Allen? Present, Chair. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Kate Hay. Present, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Jim Lomas. Present, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Phil Midgley. Present, Chair. Mr. David Rowe. Present, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Michael Green. Good afternoon, Present, Chair. Thank you. We also have all the members of the public and press attending the virtual meeting as observers. May I point out that the microphones of any external attendees, such as the press and public, will be muted during the meeting, but will need to be unmuted if they have requested to address the committee. If anyone intends to record today's meeting, please ensure that this does not disturb the conduct of the meeting. Please ensure that your mobile phones are switched to silent mode. I would like to inform members of the public and press that today's meeting will be audio-visually recorded. 
By joining the meeting, you accept that you will be recorded and your images retained and broadcast by the Council. The meeting is proceeding today on the basis that all members of the committee have read their agenda papers thoroughly and are aware of what they will be considering today. If any member of the committee leaves the virtual meeting during consideration of the application, they should ensure they do not take part in the vote on their return, as they will not have heard all the relevant information on this particular item. If anyone who is participating in the meeting or listening to the debate is disconnected, officers will inform me as chair when this becomes apparent. I will adjourn the meeting to allow officers to reconnect the individual concerned. When the individual has rejoined the meeting, I will reconvene the meeting and debate on the application will continue. I would like to outline how the meeting will be conducted. When we get to the formal item of business to be considered, I will ask the planning case officer to introduce the report. Upon the conclusion of their presentation, I will ask any individual who was requested to speak if they wish to address the committee. At the conclusion of their speech, I will ask any member of the committee to indicate by raising their hand if they wish to speak or ask to speak for a question. After all individuals who have requested to speak are spoken as part of the debate, I will then ask each member of the committee to indicate by raising their hand if they wish to comment on the report or ask the planning case officer a question. I will then ask the planning case officer to respond immediately to any question which has been put and requires a response. After every committee member has had the opportunity to speak, I will ask the final time if any committee member wishes to speak again by the raising of their hand. If no member wishes to speak again, I will move and read out the uh, recommendation within the report and ask for the motion to be moved and seconded. I will then ask each committee member individually if they agree the recommendation or whether they wish to abstain or refuse the motion. Is that clear? Yes, Chair. Yes, Chair. Thank you. Item one is apologies for absence. Do we have any apologies for absence? Chair, we're just waiting for Councillor Healy to attend, but obviously yep. he can't vote on an item if he just attends halfway through. So we'll, we'll just have to keep an eye on him when he comes in to the meeting. Yep. No problem, thank you. Item two, exclusion of the press and public. There are no items on the agenda where the public and press are to be excluded. Is that agreed? Great, Chair. Yes. Thank you. Item three, declarations of interest. Are there any declarations of interest, please? And if so, contact Amber to obtain a declaration form to complete and forward it to Government Services. Uh, Councillor Cox, you've got your hand raised. I have. I've got a declaration of interest for number one as Ward Councillor and number three as knowing two parties um, to that application. Okay, thank you for that, Councillor Cox. Thank you. Item four. Chair, yeah, sorry, point of order. Is that prejudicial declaration or is I just, it? I was just about to say that. <laughs> what kind of interest is are they, councillor? Um, we one one has been work has done work for us, and another one is we know the applicant, so I'll be abstaining from that one. Okay. All right. Thank you for that. Item four: the planning committee meeting held on the second of February, twenty twenty one. Can they be moved as a true record and accurate? I'll move, I'll move it. Good chair. Good chair. Thank you. Is that agreed? Agreed, chair. Agreed, chair. Okay, thank you. Okay, we're now up to item five, which is the schedule of applications. Um, application one, uh, I've been informed by officers that the planning application has been withdrawn from today's meeting and has been deferred to be considered at a future meeting due to the receipt of individual, sorry, additional information relating to land ownership. Therefore, I will move on to application number two. Okay, application no, uh, number two. I apologise, I've got old glasses on because I've broken another pair. Uh, application number two. Uh, 20 oblique 00434 oblique FULM for the residential development comprising of 72 dwellings, including associated works of landscaping, public open space, a means of access, and car parking on land between Doncaster Road and Lingswain, Hatfield, Doncaster. 
I would now like to invite Nicola Elliott, the planning case officer, to introduce this item. Thank you, Chair. I'll just find the presentation. Okay, can everyone see that? Yeah. Thank yeah, you. That. Okay, so um, this application uh, seeks planning permission in full for the erection of 72 dwellings, uh, which are mostly two storeys in height. There is an exception of one house type, which is two and a half storeys in height, and the properties accommodate between two and four bedrooms. Uh, most of the parking is accommodated on driveways. There are, however, four garages and also on street parking. Uh, the properties will be brick built in a mixture of red and multi-red bricks with grey tiled roofs. The access uh, for the development will be via Doncaster Road to the north west. Uh, a separate pedestrian access is also created to the site frontage and this will be in close proximity to the pedestrian refuge um, to ease permeability through the site. Uh, there's a small area of public open space on site which will accommodate a, a, a local area of play which is a small uh, equipped area of usually three pieces of equipment for young children. Uh, there's also uh, an attenuation basin on site which will be underground and then roughly grassed over which will also allow for further informal play. To increase the offer of public open space, agreements been made with the developer on the adjacent site to allow for footpath linkages into their POS, and this would be secured by a Grampian condition. The site is defined as countryside policy area in accordance with the Doncaster Unitary Development Plan, and as such, it's a departure from that plan. However, the local plan, which is not yet adopted, allocates the site for residential development. The adjacent site to the southwest is currently undergoing an extensive residential development. Therefore, once completed, the application site would be surrounded by residential development, and this development would be seen as a continuation of the built form. It's situated in flood risk zone one, and therefore has low probability of flooding. Uh, there are, There is archeological potential on the site due to the presence of a mound on site, and also from the results of the archeological in investigation on the adjacent site. However, South Yorkshire Archaeology raised no objection subject to condition for further investigation and mitigation if necessary. Uh, with regard to the trees on site, three ne through negotiation, T6, uh, which is approximately here, um, which is an oak tree, is to be retained. However, T5, which is a sycamore, um, is to be removed and unfortunately this is incorrectly stated in the report that this tree would remain but it's not it's marked for removal um, however t8 which is a holly tree uh, is is to remain on site uh, the application has been subject to a viability appraisal and the findings of the council's independent advisor in the first instance were disputed uh, therefore by the developer therefore a second opinion was sought from an, um, another independent advisor to the council and following a review of the additional information it's now considered that the scheme can provide approximately £688,000 in the section 106 contributions. Uh, a meeting of the section 106 board concluded that the money should provide 16 school places at Dunsville Primary School with the remainder of the site being uh, remainder of the balance being for on-site affordable housing as this was seen as a greater community benefit. Uh, to take you through some more of the slides, um, as I said, this is the, an aerial view, but it's taken before the development to the southwest. So the, the site in question is this area here, which is which is brown. Uh, there's the proposed site plan again: access from Doncaster Road, pedestrian cut through onto the road with the pedestrian refuge, the public open space with the attenuation tank, linkages through to the adjacent site. Um, to use the POS. Uh, there's just some example elevations there. I've not put all of the elevations on. So we can see the tr of traditional form. Uh, I've put a couple of slides on to show the extent of the adjacent development. So again, this triangular piece of land here is the site subject to this application. Uh, and this is the master plan that was on the uh, adjacent site for, for the outline application. Um, the plan next to it is the reserve matters for part of the site which is directly adjacent to this site being considered today. 
some photographs now. So this is stood from the other side of Doncaster Road, uh, looking into the site to the southwest. And you can see development there to Lings Lane at the back. Again, stood at the other side of the road, looking to the southeast. And in the background, you can see uh, the new development taking place. Uh, this is the oak tree uh, that was discussed previously and also the sycamore. Uh, this is the view to the northeast. And these photographs were taken from inside the site, uh, which is the view to the northeast, which is existing development on uh, Lings Lane. This is the mound, which was discussed as part of the archaeology. This is to the uh, towards the new development that's taking place. And again, a further photograph of the new development taking place. And this one is viewed towards the north. Uh, the site in the background here recently received plan outline planning permission for another dwelling um, at a planning committee in October. OK, so um, with regard to the pre-committee amendments, um, there are a number of revisions to the conditions set out, but this is mainly in respect of timing, so not to be pre-commencement, but prior to any um, sort of construction foundation construction taking place. Um, a request has also been made from the tree officer to add reference to the Arboricultural Technical Statement in Condition 2 because this referred to ground protection. Uh, a late representation has also been received from an interested party who's already made representations to the application but is unable to attend today's planning committee. Uh, they make reference to the proposals not taking account of a cherry tree within their garden. However, following a uh, dialogue with the tree officer, this tree is not within the application site and it is separated by a boundary wall. Therefore, this would likely restrict any route ingress beyond the wall to, into the site. And they also refer to issues relating to potential increase in crime, lack of school places, impact on infrastructure, ecology and archaeology. And as the report highlights, uh, key consultees have been consulted on these issues and raised no objections subject to condition. Uh, therefore, taking into account the relevant policies and material considerations, the proposal is recommended for approval subject to the signing of a Section 106 agreement and a number of conditions. Thank you. Thank you for that, Nicola. We have Mrs Kate, a local resident, who has requested to speak in opposition to the application. This is now your opportunity to address the committee for up to five minutes. Please mute your microphone when you've concluded your submission. And we will let you know when you've got one minute remaining. Would you like to commence? Absolutely. If you can hear me loud and clear. Yeah. Yeah, is that all right? Um, good afternoon, everybody. I'm speaking as a resident on Doncaster Road. If I can explain, our property is, is literally next door to F Cross and Sons um, garage on the main road. So we look out of our windows onto the land in question. Um, and therefore the impact of this build and the proposed development on our property is, is huge, uh, which is why I just wanted to put forward a personal stance onto it um, and, and, and sort of explain to you how it's going to affect us as a family um, and, and the surrounding areas, because I, I appreciate all the reports have been carried out and, and it's been looked into, but um, I think it's important for these matters to, to get that personal view and to see how it would affect um, you know, a, a family like mine. And I, I know you've got no duty to consider my view out my bedroom window, the fact I can wake up and look, look at rabbits and deer um, and, and other animals play, playing across the land. But um, as a family, I think it's important to put forward my th for, thoughts. Um, I think the main problem that we have is if this development was a standalone development, I could understand the logic to it, but it's not. It, it's an addition to the Linden Homes development next door to it and the Barrett Homes development next door to that. And then the Mel's Builders development on the back of Lings Lane. So within a, a, a one mile square radius, you've got potentially four new housing developments and the impact of each of them together in relation to the noise, the highways, the roads and the local services is going to be immense. Uh, even with the, the Barrett Homes, Mel's and Linden so far, there's been an influx in, in traffic issues, 
trying to get through to the doctor's surgeries, which are, are grossly um, overpopulated in the locality, is, is, is impossible. So you add another 72 properties into that mix and without additional amenities. And it, it's it's not going to be a place to live anymore because you, you won't have access to, to, you know, schools that are over overcrowded, doctors that aren't overcrowded and other essential amenities. Um, on top of that, the I, and I, I'm aware there's always already been highways um, reports, but that doesn't take into consideration the fact for the past year we've been in the global pandemic. And as a result of that pandemic, the traffic's not a true reflection of what traffic and, and the impact on highways would be um, should the development be built now. So we have concerns. I mean, we can't. We have a four-year-old um, daughter, and she cannot cross that road safely. Um, she cannot play on the front. She cannot even walk on the front because of the volume of traffic. Um, I think adding in another 72 properties is just going to render Hatfield or the outskirts of Hatfield that was once beautiful fields and green belt um, not a safe place for families to live anymore. And uh, you know, I, I could repeat myself. I could I could repeat my personal views on it, but I, th I think the important is to look at the impact on the community and um, how much a development, adding another development after Lyndon, Mells and Barrett is going to have um, an effect on that. And I don't need any more than what I've said, so I, I will mute my microphone and thank you very much for my time. Thank you very much for that. I will now ask the committee members to indicate by raising of their hand if they wish to ask uh, Mr. Shake, any questions in relation to the submission? Um, do any members wish to ask a question? Okay, thank you. It's not showing. So thank you for that, Mrs. Haig. Okay, we now have Mr. Jim Lomas, the agent, was requested to speak in support of the application. This is now your opportunity to address the committee for up to five minutes. Please mute your microphone when you've concluded your submission and I will let you know when you've got one minute remaining, if you'd like to commence. Thank you, Chair, and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, there's not a lot more I can really add to the very comprehensive report that's um, already been put before you. Equally, I think uh, Nicola Ellis also provide you a very comprehensive verbal statement on the status of the site and the, uh, the scheme uh, which is before you today. However, I just want to reiterate a few points, if that's OK. Uh, first of all, <clears throat> The site itself is uh, firstly a very sustainable location within the Hatfield area. You'll be well aware it's located in a flood zone one. It lies close to schools, shops, bus services, uh, places of employment. So effectively, it does represent a sustainable opportunity to deliver more housing. I think you'll also see from the officer report there's actually no technical issues or any technical difficulties associated with the redevelopment of this piece of land. Some such matters as highways, drainage, trees, all being considered in considerable depth. And certainly there's no objections or any matters that can't be addressed through the imposition of, tree, of uh, various planning conditions. <coughs> Excuse me. One thing that is identified in the officer report is actually identified as a, an almost an island site. I think for those of you who are familiar with this particular parcel of land, you'll realise it's very much set within a residential context. Houses are located to Lings Lane, Doncaster Road and certainly to the south uh, west on the new Linden Home Scheme. <coughs> that Linden Home Scheme comprises part of an overall sort of redevelopment of over 400 houses in the area. So this effectively is the last piece of uh, effectively a former agricultural land in that part of Hatfield. And as is reported, uh, the site itself is identified in policy terms as a countryside policy area and also a uh, countryside policy protection area under both the UDP and core strategy. However, both of these sites are, in my opinion, considerably out of date and certainly the emerging local plan for Doncaster, which has already been through some uh, rounds of examination, is identifying this particular site, I think it's site number 170, as a housing allocation. So clearly it's an allocation which is going to contribute towards Doncaster's strategic housing requirements in the foreseeable future. I think, again, looking at the quality of the overall land, I've mentioned it's already bound by housing, but effectively it's basically low-grade agricultural land. It doesn't actually offer any particular agricultural merit. Equal, there's no public rights of access across it. It doesn't offer any recreational use. And being located in a highly sustainable and completely landlocked area, the provision of housing is considered to be an entirely appropriate use for the site. As far as the layout is concerned, it has been designed with uh, the South Yorkshire Design Guide very much in mind. 
Each of the properties will be provided with adequate amount of private usable amenity space in the forms of private gardens, adequate off-street car parking, and certainly the scale of built form of two storeys in the main is very much commensurate with the general character of the area. You will note that affordable housing and off-site contributions towards education have also been agreed through fairly extensive discussions with your officers and certainly very positive uh, cooperation with your officers on that particular matter to ensure that we got the right sort of figures there, which are, are viable and certainly independently assessed by your own uh, assessors. So I think in summary, it's a sustainable location. There are no technical issues arising. It's a compatible land use. It's compliant with the emerging local plan. It certainly complies with the guidelines in the South Yorkshire Design Guide. Affordable housing and other 106 contributions are being made. And I would basically consider this site to be a logical, sustainable, compatible and certainly policy compliant form of development. So I hope you can uh, support your officer recommendation this afternoon. If there are any, uh, any questions or anything you want to discuss with me, happy to do my best. OK, thank you very much. Thank you, that, Mr Lomar. I will now ask the committee members to indicate by raising of their hand if they wish to ask Mr Lomas any question in relation to the submission. None, Chair. I'm just scrolling through and checking, thank you. Um, as part of the debate, I will now ask the committee members to indicate by raising their hand if they wish to comment on the report or ask the planning case officer a question. Councillor Cooper. Thanks, Chair. Um, quick question to Nicola. I have Jonathan's comments from early in the uh, planning process, where he's saying that uh, the best of the trees are going to be lost to development. Um, I couldn't find a tree survey in the supporting documents on the planning portal. Is it the case that this application was submitted, Nicola, without a tree survey or has one been provided? I, don't, I certainly have a tree survey on file um, and Jonathan's assessed it. Um, so, so I think. Can I, can I speak? Yep, sure. I, I couldn't find the tree survey in the supporting documents, though. I've there, scoured those. There is a. Is it okay to speak? Right. Okay, Jonathan. Just one moment, Councillor Cooper, and Jonathan's going to answer for you. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Cooper. Yeah, there is a tree survey. Um, if I can share my screen, if that would help. Thank you. Uh, share content. Which one is it? Here we go. What's it? Can we see that? Yeah, I can see that, John. Right. If you go back to the start, it's like the trees really are not an issue at this site. There's only one tree of, of concern, which is, which is like Hawthorne, Sycamore, Category C, very low. Yeah. Small are, you, are you happy that the best trees are being saved, John? Yes, the, the tree I made reference to, Councillor Cooper, was the um, OT6, as you can see here, hopefully it's category A. That was originally shown for removal. Yeah, that has now been retained uh, within the scheme, subject that, to suitable ground protection measures. Is that the one where you're saying they might have to use a vac excavation system, John? Yes, yeah. 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 Ideally, that I shouldn't have development near it, but <clears throat> the benefit of its location in relation to the parking area, which I can share another map if that helps. Now, how many metres encroachment is into the RPA, John? And let me. I need to share another another plan if that's okay. Um, right. I think I've got to stop, then start again, haven't I? I think. I'm just looking for the landscape plan. I'll just ask Councillor Pickering while he's waiting. Is yours relation to uh, the trees as well, Councillor Pickering? Uh, no, it's not, Chair. No. All right. Are you OK to wait while we just do this with Councillor Cook and Jonathan then? Thank you. OK. Right. I'm just trying to bring up this uh, share thing. It doesn't always show all the plans you've got open. Oh, here it is. <coughs> Did you see that? Yeah. Yes, John. See yeah. that, Councillor Cooper. So it is a significant breach of the of the root protection area. <coughs> we did try and get the 
site redesigned to take better account of that tree in terms of zero disturbance. However, for after numerous requests, it was apparently unviable to do so. Am I so, seeing it right, John, that that's about a 50% breach? In approaching that, yes. And are you convinced that that tree is going to survive or it's not a waste of time trying to save it? If it's implemented properly, there's no reason why it shouldn't. And that's why we've got this plan. We've got the uh, separate arboricultural um, uh, technical statement, which I can also oh. share on my screen if, if you want, that shows uh, it's a method yeah, statement. So, do you want to see that? And that's captured in the condition amendment that Nick has already referred to. Yeah. So we have got a separate standalone ARB technical statement. If I can just share that as well, if that help. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. Um, Jonathan, what are they going to do? Are they going to excavate this? Not without reading that. Are they going to excavate it with the VACX and then put the cell web on top no, of the fibre? What, what, what will happen? The protective fencing will go up as normal around the oak, yeah? Yeah. Then as development proceeds, that's when the ground protection will be installed in accordance with the our in, um, technical statement. Yeah, so it's, right. a, it's an above ground no dig system. Yeah, right. So right, although Jonathan. it is a large proportion of the RPA, it's the best we could do in the view that there was on a, they weren't able to redesign that issue out by all accounts. So mm -hmm. this is the best practicable option there is an industry recognized technique the key is that it's it's implemented correctly <clears throat> and we've got belt and braces on that and, th and this is on the oak jonathan yeah and there's a little bit for t8 as well but that's a much smaller holly yeah. of lower landscape value yeah. and Not the breach isn't isn't anywhere near as much it's the oak yeah. that all our efforts really should be um I'm towards. not going to. I'm not being cynical, Jonathan, but it would be interesting to take a series of photographs of this oak tree over the next five years and see how it fares. Because you know, exactly. how well, I'd like to see it. Uh, well, the condition states all the protection's got to be pre-inspected for. Um, you know, the, the, the protection goes in place. We've got seven days to inspect it. Yeah, which you, know, you know. Our you know how susceptible oaks are to any disturbance, Jonathan. But yeah, I accept what you're saying there, Jonathan. Make good job on the uh, procedures you're going to follow. I, yeah. I do have a supplementary chair, if I may. Yeah, so, no problem. Then we'll go on to Councillor Pickering. Thanks, Chair. Um, also in Jonathan's comments is made reference to the removal of the edge row that's formed the access. And is it was it lawful or was it covered by a previous consent? Can anybody answer that, whether the removal of the edge row was covered in a previous consent or is its removal unlawful and therefore whoever's done it should be prosecuted uh, under the edge row protection order? Can I, shall I come back on that? Please. Uh, so there's new, obviously, we're all aware there's numerous parcels of development along this stretch of Doncaster Road. <clears throat> There was a smaller scale development of only a couple of dwellings right at the northeastern end, I believe. As I gather, the wrong set of hedgerow was removed uh, that should have been removed for that development. We know about it and it's going to be gapped up as part of, of one of the of the relevant consents. You know so, where I'm, you know what you know what I'm coming to next, Jonathan. When is this authority actually going to prosecute somebody for taking something out ir irrespective of whether it's a mistake? Right. If, they, if somebody's, Cooper. if somebody's Cooper, taken, can we, Councillor Cooper, can we stick to this application, please? We're not well, here to enforce it's going to be taken. I am right. sure. It is this, ap it is this application. Councillor that... Cooper, we're not here to discuss enforcement action for something that's happened and that's been dealt with. So we need well, to make sure. Has it been dealt with, Chair? Has it been dealt the, with? The, the, Jonathan's just said that it's, it's, it's being dealt with. So what we need to do is being application. Sorry, Chair. Yeah, thank you, Jonathan. So it should have been prosecuted before that. then, Chair. I'll, I'll let that one go, but somebody does need to pursue it. Thanks, I'm sure they will. Thank you, Councillor Pickering. Uh, thank you, Chair. In, in view of the uh, lady's comments um, that uh, were, uh, obje was, is objected to the uh, problem, well. I've, I've some sympathy in that case. I know this road quite well, and at the moment it seems to be extremely busy and, and has been for a number of years. I wonder if somebody could, I was just uh, so to explain the methodology, just briefly, the methodology that's been used 
to uh, to come up with the fact that it, it's acceptable to uh, uh, unleash even more um, traffic onto the road. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for that. Okay, do we have, uh, we've, I believe we've got, uh, there you are, Steve Shannon's here, ready. Hi, Chair. Yeah, um, I mean, obviously, the we, we look at the trip generation from all of the sites that are along that road as individuals, but we also look at the the cumulative impact that will sort of come in with that. So through through a system called Tricks, we can understand the kind of generation of peak time traffic that will come in. So whether or not that would then create a, an issue with the access and egress from the development uh, that there is in the design of it, and it's been through with road safety, you know, space for someone turning right into there to be safe to uh, do that safely without impacting on the traffic flow. Um, and we've also introduced, obviously, as part of the negotiations, the additional um, pedestrian islands that will support the, the local bus stops as well. Um, the the generation of traffic along or throughout throughout Doncaster is different at the moment anyway because of of COVID. And what you might find is that actually traffic's faster because there is less traffic on there. This area has suffered a little bit from the roadworks that have been taking place further up towards Doncaster. So that might have had an impact as well and where people are sort of taking diversions to get around where the road closures and that were. So it's, it's difficult to assess. You couldn't do a count now because it's unrealistic uh, for a number of reasons. But from the information provided, uh, we're satisfied that there's the generation of traffic from this particular development won't actually create a, a problem if you if you understand what I'm saying. Okay, thank you. Do you have a supplementary question at all, Councillor Pickering? Are you happy with that? No, I'm happy with the answer. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Councillor Hughes. Um, thank you, Chair. Uh, I'm looking at the map or the layout of the site. Um, and I wonder if you could bring it up somehow for all the see as well. Um, adjacent to Doncaster Road, it's sort of like a, I can't even describe it, but still to that going down this way. Um, I want to find out what that is about. Um, I'm not, I don't know if we can actually feed on what you're putting up, but it's what they've been sent to us. Um, there are lines, sort of a um, boxes all the way along Doncaster Road. I don't know if they are on yours because I can't see yours. I, I have uh, yours on the on the on my phone. Oh sorry, it's gone now. Let me put uh, the, um, the committee the committee report up and then Yeah it's on I, I can see what you sorry uh, chair if I may just to clarify from Councillor Hughes. It's on page yeah. eighty of the members park. Uh, and there is like almost like a, something showing like an easement or something running mm -hmm. along the side of Doncaster Road. It's like a quite a thick kind of dashed line running all the way along. So I just wonder if you yeah. can. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay I'll just, just show, let show everybody that. know that we've got uh, Council Healy's joined us, but obviously won't be taking part in the voting on this application because he hasn't been here throughout. Okay, thank you for that. Okay, yeah, it's uh, Yorkshire water infrastructure uh, that, that crosses the site, and there's actually a condition on there, uh, condition on um, it's condition number. Just bear with me a second, sorry. Um, sorry, it looks like it's right at the bottom. Yeah, condition eight um, is to prevent any sort of permitted development to any of those properties there at the front so that they can't um, come any closer to that easement um, so that Yorkshire Water can protect the public water supply infrastructure that's located on there. Um, so I don't know if that, that answers your question, Councillor uh, Hughes. Uh, well, it, it does, yes, thank you very much. I, I have another question, Chair, if it's possible. Um, it's uh, about public open space on the area. Um, there's this underground tank where the children can play. Are there any kind of play equipment planned for this site, or is it just going to be, you know, with with, with that kind of uh, amount of houses and children, whatever, 
Will they have anywhere to play? Um, yep, I can also share my screen with you on there as well, so just bear with me. Yeah, so you can see the area uh, with the, the dashed green lines, that's a lap, so it's a local area, area of play and that would have uh, usually three pieces of equipment for informal play for, for young children. Um, so that would be a small area of equipment there and obviously I have double checked with the applicant that this would be usable as informal play because the, the tank's underground so it would be grassed over um, and then because it is it is deficient in public open space i mean i put the percentages in the report um so one of the reasons why we felt we could support it um albeit now that the section 106 board didn't consider there being a greater benefit in additional monies going to supplement public open space um, but we did feel that given the small area on site um, and the connection through to the adjoining development, which has a lot of public open space, and you can see sort of walkways around that site as well on there, uh, we felt it was acceptable yeah. on this on this occasion, not to say it was, you know, it would happen on every development, but given the the, uh, the, the merits on this application on its own, we felt it was acceptable. Okay, okay thank, thank you. you for that. Okay, we've got Councillor Hogarth. Yeah, just clarifying that the uh, the own space on the adjacent site is more than is required on that adjacent site, and not uh, just oh well that meets the minimum standard, so we'll and then you put another site with not enough. Uh, that yep, yeah, that's a question I don't know the answer to in terms of the um, the makeup of, of of how much public open space there is. I mean, again, I can share the screen um, to show you the level of public open space. But um, if we look at this, it's the the one on the on the right hand side. You've got play equipment there, and then obviously. Uh, I, I can't answer that question because I don't know the percentages and how much, but looking at it, it looks like there is a, a significant amount of public open space on that site. But I'd have to to go away and and, and get an, an answer for you if you if you want this, you know, the specific figures. Well, I, I would because I think if one site is using someone else's open space as their allocation, surely we should know what it is and does that meet the standard. You know, if that meets a, just meets the standard for that site, then how can another site use it without uh, knowing that it does? Uh, it's more than required for that uh, for the standard. Okay, thank you for that, Councillor Hogarth. Uh, Councillor Cooper. Thanks, Chair. Uh, Councillor Hogarth makes a good point there. I just need to get this square in my head with Nicola, if I may. Are we saying that we're not? having the open space that would be required on this development and that we've got the overflow onto the next site. So is there some extra 106 money? I've, I've missed that. I've lost track of that. Because the, we're going to use the open space next door, thereby creating a deficiency on this on the proposed application site, are we getting extra 106 money for open space or has the 106 board in its infinite wisdom decided that there's going to be no money allocated for 106? But what I'm saying is, are you still getting the full amount that you would have done 106 if some was being given to the uh, to be spent on additional open space okay um in the there is a deficit of public open space there's only a very small percentage on site so in normal circumstances we would ask for that to be made up with a commuted sum so that it could go towards enhancing other public open space but because this scheme is subject to a viability appraisal we had to um, as you'll be aware when we take things to the section 106 board we have to say what the requirements are but how much money there is available and then the 106 board go, uh, decide where they feel there's greater community benefit in that money going so because this site was adjacent to public open space that it could connect to and it had a small area on site and also the existing pos in the vicinity of the site it wasn't considered by the section 106 board that it would be a good use of the money to go towards enhancement to public open space and then it would be better spent funding uh, primary school places and any remainder for affordable housing uh, if that if that answers your question councillor it does, Nicola. I'm not happy with it because obviously we've got places like Sandal Park that could have benefited from the funding. Um, but uh, if the 106 boards decided that, then the council will be short-sighted. Uh, but we'll leave it at that. Thanks, Chair. 
Okay, thank you for that, Councillor Cooper. Okay, does any member wish to speak again on this item? Oh, Chair, oh. sorry. Chair, can I have a supplementary Thanks, question? To, can I have a supplementary question to Jonathan Tesh, please? You may. Um, it would be it would be remiss of me not to raise the question of the flowering cherry tree in the adjacent property that uh, someone's taken the trouble to write in about. When we're saying that it's not encroaching onto the proposed development site uh, and that it's got a boundary wall, has anybody checked the root protection area on this via the stem measurement to see? I mean, a, a, a cherry has got no sort of regard for a boundary wall. The roots will go under a boundary wall into the site. Do we know if the root protection zone extends into the site or if there are any branches from it hanging into the site? Right, I'll deal with that if I may. Okay, thank you. But I just need to bring up a few, I'll bring up the aerial first. Well, first of all, Councillor Cooper, okay. the it's very detailed topographical survey that was submitted picked up everything. And the boundary yeah. edges also, but for some reason it didn't pick up this cherry tree. Yeah, so we didn't know about it, and it wasn't. It is a common. Up. It is a common thing where they don't pick it up on adjacent properties, John. Yeah, but in, it, they have picked up quite a bit in adjacent properties on this, so it's odd they've missed the cherry. Yeah, so we, I, for a start, we didn't know anything about it. Having read the comments made by the by the tree owner, I gather it's they said it's a cherry tree about thirty years old. So I'm assuming it's not going to be a very big tree, which may explain why it wasn't picked up, but it still perhaps should have, well, should, still should have been picked up. But if we look at the aerials, aerial photographs, which is all we've got to go on, I'm afraid at the minute, I'm just going to get them up. Is that OK? Thank you. Um, here we are. I had them open earlier. Ten. Lings. Lane. Uh, two seconds. Right. If I zoom out a bit, then I can bring the oak in for a bit of context. Right. Uh, I'm just going to share my screen again if I can. Aerial, here we are. <clears throat> can we see that? Yep. Right, that's the nice big oak that is now being retained, yeah? Yeah, for context, we've seen photos of the oak, haven't we? Yeah, got that, John. Huge big, huge, big thing with a big shadow, yeah? Yeah. Big tree. Somewhere in here is the cherry tree. Uh, I just need to, if I can zoom in a bit, now we've got our bearings. Oh, it's come out of uh, Street View, it's come out of that. Anyway, let me just go back, apologies for this. You can see there's nothing that overhangs and how low the shadows are. Even the garage is doing a big shudder. Right, John. Yeah. And on, as I say, on the topographical plan, it does say there's a block wall. Yeah. So I really don't think this tree, you know, it is hopefully unimpaired by development. But as I say, yeah, until, there's certainly until no overhang, John, is there? I, I wouldn't have thought very much, no. Obviously, this aerial, I don't know when it's dated from. Uh, it's, I've got to move the box because it keeps getting in the way. Yeah, well, don't fall foul of the, that, the dates. I was given a photo to do a private job, and it turned out the photo was from 2014, and there was seven years' growth on it. Yeah, you can be deceived, but in the scheme of things, oh, I, was deceived. <laughs> um, I don't think the cherry need necessarily be threatened by development at all. Right. All right, Jonathan. OK, thank, thank you. Sir, Jonathan. Thanks. Um, OK, Councillor Cooper. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. OK, thank you for that. I will now read out the recommendation within the report. Is there a proposal to grant planning permission subject to a section 106 agreement? Can I ask the committee member moving and seconding the motion to identify themselves when speaking? Is there a mover for the recommendation? Yes, Councillor Wood. OK, so Councillor Hughes has moved it. Is that seconded? Yes, Chair, seconded. I'll second that, Councillor Wood. Councillor Wood seconded it. I will now ask each member individually if they are for or against the motion or if they wish to abstain. Councillor McGuinness? For the motion, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Anderson? Abstaining, Chair. 
Abstain. Thank you. Councillor Beach. For the motion, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Cooper. For the motion, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Cox. For Chair. Thank you. Councillor Hughes. And for the motion, Chair. Thank you. Sorry, Jan, I won't be asking <laughs> you on this one. Councillor Hoggart. For Chair. Thank you for that. Councillor Pickering. Against, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Wood. Yes, for Chair. Thank you. And I'm in support of the application. The recommendation is agreed and the application has been granted. Thank you for that, everybody. Application number three is a planning application two zero. Sorry, Chair, can uh, I just interrupt for one second? I'm sorry, I tried to put my hand up, but then uh, not sorry. Fine. Apologies. Um, can I just clarify with Councillor uh, Cox just before we begin this item? D just in relation to your declaration of interest, Councillor Cox, are you saying that you you will abstain from the vote on this item, or that you'll be removing yourself completely from this one? I'll abstain from vote, and I'll make no comment. Okay. Thanks Thank for you. thanks for clarifying. Thank you. Thank you for that. Okay. So planning application two zero oblique. 03003 oblique FUL for the erection of a single storey detached gym to rear garden plus erection of first floor front extension, a top flat roof attached garage, amended proposal at 152 Bortry Road, Bessica, Doncaster. I'm going to invite Andrea Sudders, the planning case officer, to introduce this item. Andrea. Thank you, Chair. I'll just share my screen with you. So can everyone see the screen? Yes, I'm good. Yep. Great. Yes, um, before we start, I'll just go through uh, a few pre-committee amendments first. So there's amendments to the report summary and paragraph 1.1 of the report. So the application has been presented to committee at the request of local ward councillors Neil Gethin and Nick Allen and because of the level of public interest. There's been an additional five representations received from three objectors. The comments echo those that have already been raised. However, they do raise new issues in relation to a smell of gas in the area and whether Cadent Gas or National Grid has been consulted. The land contamination assessment form is incorrectly completed. The screening assessment form is an abridged copy of what has been approved for, uh, provided for the um, application on the adjacent site under reference 20 forward slash 02415 forward slash FUL. Paras 6.3 to 6.4 of the case officer recommendation report incorrectly lists issues raised by objectors as non-material considerations in the assessment of the application. So paras 6.3 to 6.4 of the report have now been amended following the above representation and should now read as follows. Paragraph 6.3. The letters of objection are in regard to the following summarised points. Piecemeal over development in this part of the Bessica conservation area due to ongoing and previously granted applications. Compounded impact of ongoing and previously granted applications on habitat loss and biodiversity compounded impact of light pollution, compounded impact of development on the drainage system. So paragraph 6.4 now reads as follows. This application is a householder application to extend an existing property. And while the issues raised are material planning considerations, they are not considerations for this application. These issues are considerations to be taken into account in relation to new housing developments, such as that proposed on the adjacent site, concurrently being considered under application reference 20 forward slash 02415 forward slash FUL. Um, there's also an amendment to paragraph eight of the report in the consultee responses. National Grid um, have raised no objections to the proposal. We've also got speakers for the application. Uh, Mr. Phil Midgley is speaking in opposition. The agent David Rowe is now speaking in support and councillor Nick Allen is speaking in opposition. So <clears throat> the application itself. So this slide shows the site edged red, but there's also another application running concurrently, which utilises the rear gardens of 152 
154 and 156 Bawtry Road. This proposes three detached houses and it's shown in blue on the plan there. The site's located in the Bessica Conservation Area. This aerial photograph shows the extent of the site and it shows the existing conifer hedge to be retained in the rear garden. So these are site photos looking from Bawtry Road towards the rear garden. And then on the second photograph on your right, there's the existing conifer hedge to be retained in the rear garden. The um, site photos here show the front of the house viewed from Bawtry Road, and there's also a rear view of the house as existing. However, there is also planning consent granted for a two storey rear extension and a single storey rear extension um, on the back of the property. So the agent has shown this on the existing plans. And the um, site plan shows the originally submitted application and the amended application. So the application proposes a first floor extension to the front above the existing garage and a detached gym in the rear garden. Both the size of the gym and the front extension have been reduced in scale at the request of the conservation officer. The reduction to the detached gym is apparent when you compare the original and the amended site plans. The conservation officer considered that the gym impacted on the conservation area on account of its size and originally spanning the to the full width of the boundary on the left hand side. This issue is now overcome as it's been moved away from the southern boundary of the site. So you can see the scale of the um, amended front extension um, is also subservient to the house and the size of the site can easily accommodate the detached gym building. So there's still ample garden amenity space remaining. This is the proposed gym floor plans and you can see the length of the gym. It's been reduced from 19.1 metres to 15.1 metres to address the case officer's concerns of scale and massing and the conservation officer's concerns of the gym being visible from Borchy Road. The conservation officer is now satisfied with the sighting and the size of the gym. These are the elevations facing the um, house. The level of glazing to the gym has been reduced in line with the reduction in the length to, pre to prevent the building from dominating the rear garden. The rear elevation uh, will be mostly screened by the existing conifer hedge and so would have no detrimental impact to the west of the site. The gym has been designed with a sloping roof, so the main uh, mass of the building is being away from the boundary. So this will measure three metres in height on the boundary adjacent with the conifer hedge and 3.7 metres to the highest part of the ridge. The materials will be a timber clad frontage and rendered walls. Looking at the floor plans to the front extension, um, the, this shows the floor plans um, as originally submitted and as amended on the right. You can see that originally the extension wrapped around the front on the left um, drawing. This has been reduced to make it a more cohesive design that's subservient to the host dwelling. This is following comments from the case officer and the conservation officer. Looking at the front elevations, the original design for the front elevation, um, the front extension, sorry, which is the top drawing, was overbearing and dominated the house dwelling. The amended design, which is the middle drawing, is subservient and sympathetic to the house dwelling. The conservation officer is satisfied that the amended design isn't harmful to the character of the house dwelling or the conservation area. The um, original design for the front extension included a, a first floor side extension, which would have been visible from the rear elevation and this would have looked out of place. So the amended design has no side extension and it also retains the original flat roof of the garage. Part of the southeast side elevation is visible from Borchy Road and you can see from the top drawing that the original design enveloped the host dwelling to the side and was dominating and inappropriate. So the amended design is set down at the ridge and sympathetic to the character of the host dwelling and the conservation area. Looking at the reduced ridge of the extension on the middle drawing, you can see that it's subservient to the host dwelling and it's considered an appropriate form of development. 
there's been a number of objections received on this application, but they've been predominantly with regards to the impact on the conservation area. But also there's been comments on the land contamination, as I referred to earlier. In particular, um, the comments are with regard to the sand pit within the vicinity and the level of information submitted for this application in comparison with the adjacent site. So I just want to clarify the difference between this site and the adjacent one. Pollution control identified the historic sand pit in the vicinity during their planning constraint checking. It remains unclear if the sand pit has ever been infilled with any waste material and therefore the likelihood of any gas production or migration is uncertain. Hence the land is referred to as potentially infilled land. For extensions such as this within 250 metres of potentially infilled land, uh, a standard landfill informative is required to ensure the developer is made aware of the potential land use. As extensions are generally small with limited associated groundworks, any potential risks from such developments are considered low and as a result contaminated land conditions are considered unreasonable. But for new residential builds, as with the adjacent site that are within 250 metres of potentially infilled land, standard contamination land conditions are required. As new builds involve extensive groundworks and associated infrastructures, the potential risks are considered to be greater. Therefore, for this household application, an informative note is included to cover land contamination. Um, just for information, we've also got the pollution officer here to answer any questions should committee um, want to um, ask any questions regarding the land contamination. So in summary, the front and rear extensions are considered to preserve the existing character of the host dwelling and that of the conservation area. The application complies with local and national policies and the application is recommended for approval. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for that. OK, we've got Councillor Nick Allen, ward member, has requested to speak in opposition to the application. This is now your opportunity to address the committee for up to five minutes. Please mute your microphone when you've concluded your submission and I'll let you know when you've got one minute remaining. Councillor Allen, would you like to commence? Uh, thank you, Susan. I won't... Um... I won't take up the whole five minutes. I'm going to keep my comments as brief as I can. Uh, basically, obviously, this uh, development would take place in the Bessica Conservation Area, and there has been over um, many um, years a, a sort of, I don't know, a piecemeal sort of right to overdevelop, which has um, been exploited to such an extent that actually it would, you know, it's had a substantial impact on the conservation area. Um, I just feel that. Um, uh, essentially doing this sort of allowing this type of development to continue unhindered sort of negates the entire purpose of having the conservation area and you know you've seen some of the sort of very substantial problems which have been um, mitigated to an extent by some of the changes which have been presented but when you think about it I mean this development concurrent with the others would have a, a, a really substantial impact on residents living on Broughton Road and, you know, it would lead to all sorts of um, overlooking. It, it would uh, not least, you know, the other um, the other sort of more material conditions, like the fact that I believe the uh, contamination and soil erosion report is now in the hands of the applicants and things, which is, uh, or the responsibility to pursue that would be in the hands of the applicants, which is really, you know, again, a very, um, a very substantial issue. I don't, uh, although it does com um, comply with sort of national and local policies, um, I, I just don't feel it's right that we continue with this sort of, essentially this garden grabbing in the conservation area. I mean, many people have to, you know, they call the conservation area home. Um, there are a multitude of different issues, not least the way we treat wildlife, for example. And uh, this type of development is, um, although it might well be permissible, it isn't logical to do it. Um, so that you know, they're my they're my remarks on the matter. I do as well know that we have um, you know there is a substantial amount of local opposition, uh, not least as well, for example, in terms of sort of how local people have been able to engage with council officials. We did have a meeting with Roy Sykes, and um, I know my colleague Councillor Gethin has called it in too. Um, I do think the committee ought to take that into account. 
Um, not not least the fact, you know, although the council have said, oh, grant permission, I do want to stress there is a significant level of local opposition, not just from Broughton Road as well, but other parts of Borgia Road too. Excuse me, Chair, you're on, you're on mute. You're on mute, Susan, sorry. I've just finished. I'll put myself on Thank mute. Thank you. <laughs> oh, thank you. Okay, I'm going to ask now if there's any member of the committee that would like to ask Councillor Allen a question. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, I've now got Mr Phil Midley, a local resident, that's requested to speak in opposition to the application. This is now your opportunity to address the committee for up to five minutes. Please mute your microphone when you've concluded your submission and I will let you know when you've got one minute remaining. Uh, Mr Midgley, would you like to commence? Yeah, before I commence, can I just declare a bit of interest? <clears throat> I'm, um, I am not familiar with the um, applicant, but I am familiar with the applicant's mother-in-law, who is Yvonne Woodcock, Councillor Woodcock, who I've known for many, many years. She's a, a friend of a friend of which I've been in her company uh, many times. Um, socially, I should add on that. And my wife does have some association with her, but until half past, till quarter past one this afternoon, I had no idea of the relationship. It was Councillor Alan, Alan who made that point to, to me uh, on that. Okay. So I'll just declare that side of it. It doesn't really materially affect what I'm saying, but just to keep get the record straight. Thank you very much. Right. I'd like to comment. Okay, can I show my slide, the first slide, the objection slide, and pick up from uh, um, Councillor Allen, uh, what he said on the, <laughs> the short notice uh, particularly. Um, we did ask for um, uh, this to be delayed because the lead objector, unfortunately, is in hospital this afternoon. We were only given about seven, nine days notice of this. So I'm preparing somebody, else, using somebody else's material, preparing that. And we feel that we ought to have been granted a bit more time. It took 30 days from Councillor Allen asking for a meeting with the council to, to us getting that meeting, and we've got seven or eight days to prepare. So I'll make that point just to uh, on that. We could turn to the second slide. I can't see any slides actually, so I don't know if you've got my my slides. My my the screen here at the moment is just showing the chair. Are we able to get the slides up, please? Just yeah. just bear with me, Chair. I'm just trying to um, bring this, the presentation up. Yeah, can we go back okay. to slide one, Andrew? Because we haven't seen that. Thanks. Yeah, that, the first slide was just a title slide. Yeah, yeah. So if you do slide two, um, whether is met, that it? That one? Yeah, that's the one. Yeah. When we met with uh, um, Mr. Sykes, I mean, he made the point. The first two things were attributable to him that the pan that planning is not a science; it can be subjective. So we wish also to have a, a, an opinion on this, and you rely on professional judgment. Um, our views, just in summary, um, we can go on to the second slide in a moment, like the short time scale for the re uh, response um, to this. Erroneous data, requests for information has not been forthcoming, and so on and so forth about the conservation area. If you can show me the, the next slide, please. The slide that uh, you will see shortly, I hope, um, with entitled... It doesn't seem to be working, sorry. Okay. It's not okay. moving. Just bear with me a minute. Can we have time added on there, please? <laughs> but the, uh, the, the it's relative to missing it's buildings, so it shows this. It shows a picture of the uh, uh, of the layout that you've just seen, and next to it are the areas showing buildings that now are, are being built, together with the properties that are due to be built or will be coming to be built under the application. Probably easier there. No, if you go back, what? Go back. And again. No, sorry. This is the. Slide the presentation's not working properly. It's not oh. responding. It's slide number three that um, I wish to have. That's the one. The, the missing buildings conservation area. Now, the left hand of the uh, picture of the two slides is what was shown before. The right hand shows the buildings that are already in place and the mustard coloured ones are the ones that are due, which have been raised under the other planning application that runs concurrently with that. Uh, just so that people know what we've got there. Can I have the next slide, please? Because this is a bit more meat onto this one about the non-adherence to published uh, policies that we've got. And we feel it's contrary to a lot of these uh, of the 
the core strategy, the CS1, 14, 15, 16, et cetera, and it conflicts with, with other guidance. The 585910 should actually read uh, on this one, that's my error, it's uh, 117124127170 of the NF MPPF, and it fails to comply with some of these local plans, as well as the contrary to the uh, um, supplementary planning documents about piecemeal backland development, overdevelopment, garden amenity. Um, obviously, we, you know, we are concerned uh, about that. If you do the next slide, please. And it's just what we've referred to as the significant non-conformities. And basically, it's a summary of what you've already seen, about, but highlighted some of them, that Bessica will be protected from further backland and tandem development. Well, it's not, because it's been developed at the moment. And proposals that will be refused that result in harm. We hope to show that in a moment. And it fails to complement the local area. It will, it will be refused. And similarly, these piecemeal backlands will be resisted if we possibly can. Then go to the, to the next slide, please, because this is where I get to the meet with the sand pit issues. So we have. Um, Just to let you know, you've got one minute remaining, Mr. Midgeway. Right. I'm not allowed in. Okay. The sandpitch issues. Okay, we were, we we're aware of a potential problem. The application form filled in said the, the uh, applicant had no history of soil contamination. The, the note came back that the, the council referred to it. The applicant submits the screening form the day before the information comes out, claiming no history of the contamination. I don't, I don't know whether that's an oversight or whatever. DNBC have also overlooked this error. So. Our view on this particular one is with relative to this, what well, we put toxic gas, that surely we should be looking at this first before uh, granting any permission. And if there's, there's no gas, then fair enough, because it is going to affect the adjacent property, which you've highlighted on there. And uh, is it reasonable to expect an applicant uh, to, to do this study? I'm not suggesting any, anything untoward, but I'm just saying that, you know, that I don't think, I think this is too important to be relied on the applicant. There's too much pressure on, on that particular case. Matthew Julian's report refer out to this. Okay, thank you for that, Mr. Mr. Apologies, but you're five minutes are up, and I did pause it while I was having problems with the uh, uh, PowerPoint as well. Right. Uh, so I'm going to go over to the uh, committee members now, see if they've got any questions they would like to ask you. Yep. So thank you for that. Thank you. Okay, do we have any committee members that would like to ask Mr. Mishri a question? Okay, thank you. It's not shown that there's any questions to be asked. Okay, I've now got Mr. Rowe, the agent, who will be sharing, sorry, will be speaking for five minutes to support the application. This is now your opportunity to address the committee for up to five minutes. Please mute your microphone when you've concluded your submission. I will let you know when you have one minute remaining. Uh, Mr. Rowe, would you like to comment? Good afternoon, Chair. Um, thank you for the opportunity. The proposal is for a um, householder residential application uh, consisting of a first floor extension to the main house and what is a single storey outbuilding to the rear of the garden. We've worked with the case officer and the conservation officer to achieve the current proposal that is in front of you today. And we have reduced both the extension and the outbuilding to the main dwelling to achieve the to achieve the support of DNBC. Looking through the comments raised, the main objections relate to the single storey outbuilding located to the rear. This outbuilding is currently positioned 2.7 metres from the rear boundary, 1.6 metres from the eastern boundary, from the western boundary, sorry, and uh, 6.5 metres from the east boundary with a maximum height of 3.7 metres. We've, we've worked with DMBC to achieve uh, this current situation that we're in, um, but we seem to be feeling that the, the scheme is being held on the outbuilding or the objections raised. One thing we wanted to know is that this house, uh, it should be noted that this pro proposal, whilst we've submitted it, does actually have its permitted development rights and we could actually submit an application for permitted development of an outbuilding without the conservation areas uh, and local authorities' consent. Um, but the client and ourselves and long-term relationship, we've worked with everybody to try and achieve the scheme that's in front of you today. 
Should we wanted to submit a permitted application, the scheme would actually be larger than what is in front of you. And whilst this is not the uh, desired objective, we would like the support that has been given and from the local authority. Um, we'd like to thank DMBC for their assistance and the conservation officer for their time to achieve the design that's uh, in front of you. Thank you very much. OK, thank you for that, Mr Rowe. Uh, do any committee members have any questions for Mr Rowe? If you could raise your hand, please. Councillor Beach. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr Rowe. Good afternoon. Um, is this gym for just for personal use? Uh, and subject to your answer, I might have another question. You're on mute. <laughs> I've not started speaking yet. Uh, yes, the scheme is for personal use. It is not a commercial gym that has been uh, accused in at the start of uh, when objections were first raised. So it is just for the residents of the of the uh, family home. Right, thank you. Um, because what worried me was um, sometimes these gyms uh, do create somewhat of noise. But, um, you know, not not equipment so much as, but when people are doing these exercises to music, which can be uh, rather loud. So, um, you know, w w is anything like that um, anticipated or is it just for equipment? It's just for equipment. I don't see the uh, introduction of a, a mainstream gym going in this garden. Thank you. Not a problem. Okay, thank you for that, Councillor Beach. Uh, do we have any other questions for Mr Rowe? Okay, thank you for your time, Mr Rowe. Okay, as part of the debate, I will now ask the committee members to indicate by raising their hand if they wish to comment on the report or ask the planning case officer a question. Councillor Healy. Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. It, it, it's a query. Um, I'm just concerned by what uh, Mr Rowe has said in terms of the, the uh, they brought forward a, a planning application rather than going through with permitted development rights. Therefore, my question is to the uh, legal officer, uh, is he right in this respect? I'm, I'm not doubting you, but I'm no expert. Um, and I'm just asking the legal officer um, wh wh what the balance is between this or whether or not Andrea could uh, uh, query the case officer. Uh, I just I think, I think, sorry, Councillor Hilly, I think this is one for, for perhaps Andrea, if you don't mind, because I, I believe this the, the outbuilding would be slightly outside PD tolerances. Is that correct, Andrea? Uh, this particular one, yes, Stacey. Um, what they could do, though, um, using permitted development rights, they could erect a building up to 2.5 metres in height um, if it was within two metres of the boundary. So this current application, it is within two metres of the boundary. So the maximum height that they could um, construct a building under would be two and a half metres, whereas this application, we're looking at 3.7 metres maximum. However, if the applicant were to move the siting of the building two metres or more away from any fence, then they could construct a detached outbuilding up to four metres in height. And that would be four metres up to the ridge, so the highest part of the uh, building. OK, thank you for that, Andrea. Uh, do you have a supplementary uh, question, John? Uh, wait a minute. Uh, not a supplementary, Chair, but I think uh, at some point, because there is a, a conflict here, uh, planning members need to be made much more aware of this. And I'm, I'm just wondering whether or not it could be noted for a, a future training session, Chair. Thank you. Thank you for that, John. Uh, Mr Rowe, I'm not allowed to fetch you in now into the... Uh, thank you. Uh, do we have any other committee member wishing to ask a question of the officer? No, thank you. I will now read out the recommendation within the report. Is there a proposal to grant planning permission? Can I ask the committee members moving and seconding the motion to identify themselves when speaking? Is there a mover for the recommendation? Councillor Sue McGuinness, move it, Chair. 
Thank you. Is there a seconder? I'm happy to second oh. that. Right, okay. <laughs> okay. I will now ask each member individually if they are for or against the motion or if they wish to abstain. <laughs> Councillor McGuinness? For it, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Anderson? Chair, sure, I lost connection for a about 30 seconds there, so I'm not going to vote. OK, so I'll put you down as an abstention. Is that OK, Councillor Anderson? Yeah, that's fine. Thank you. Councillor Beach? Against. Thank you, Councillor Cooper? Against. Councillor Cox? Uh, Councillor Cox is not voting, he's abstaining. Not voting, abstaining. Councillor Hughes? Oh, I'm abstaining. Okay, Councillor Healy. I'm abstaining. Councillor Hogarth. For chair. Councillor Pickering. Against chair. Councillor Wood. I'm going to abstain as well, chair. OK, will you tally up where we are now with the vote, please? <laughs> Voted, Chair. I'm in favour. I'm in favour. So that's it. three, yeah. three, Chair, because we've got five abstentions. It's not technically a vote, so we've got three votes for and three against. So you have the casting vote, Chair, if you... Amber, can I just... Just, just, just check. I've just, I could be wrong, Chair. Apologies for inter interjecting, but I've just got Councillor Beach and Councillor um, Pickering against. Uh, is that correct, Amber? Would you say? So I'm, I'm, Councillor Cooper wrong. as well. Councillor Cooper as well. I do apologise. I, I didn't hear that. Sorry. My apologies, so, Chair. So, Thank Chair, you. you've got three, four, and three against. The five abstentions you can't count because they're not voting technically. So you need to, there's a casting vote if you want to use right. that chair. Just we'll throw that again. I, it, you broke up um, Amber, I didn't hear that. Sorry, chair. Got... So you've got three for the motion and three against. You have five abstentions, but they're technically not a vote. So you've got three for, three against. So you can use your casting vote if you want to. Okay. And therefore, I'm going to support the application. So, so that's, therefore, that's granted, Chair. The application being granted, yeah. Chair, okay, I, Chair could I just check that everybody can hear me? Because I, I, I kind of lost a lot of, like uh, Councillor Anderson, I, I seem to lose Mr Rowe there for a lot of his presentation. And I, and I, I abstained, obviously, because I just didn't think it was fair if we haven't heard all the debate. Right. Uh, thank you, Councillor Woods. Can I just... That if for any reason, if you drop out, you need to let us know because we can, as we stated, we can actually stop the meeting while we fetch you back into the meeting. If there is any problem with the sound or hearing anyone speaking, we we need to be known. There's the chat part as well that could say you've got a, a problem so that you can be involved. I'm not okay. aware that anyone dropped out of the meeting, Chair. Yeah, could I just add, Chair, members, if you're struggling to hear and you want anything repeating, just please raise your hand and, and ask for that, because it is important that you hear everything uh, before you make a decision on the applications. Yeah, just, I just personally, I, I, mine just seemed to freeze a bit there. I didn't I didn't feel I'd lost the connection, but it just froze. And I, I you know, I, I just, you know, lost for a few minutes. But I think we've got, you know, what we want out of this anyway. So I would hope that the applicant's happy at this point. Thank you for that, Councillor Wood. OK, we now have application number four, which is plan application 20 oblique 03480 oblique FUL for the erection of two semi detached dwellings on land adjacent to 36 Avenue Road, Edenthorpe. And I'd like to invite Jacob George, the planning case officer, to introduce this item. Over to you, Jacob. Thank you, Chair. I'm just showing my presentation. Can everyone see that? Yes. Got it. Yeah. Thank yes. you. Yes, thank you. Okay, great. Um, so this application is for a pair of three bedroom semi-detached houses. 
um, to the side of 36 Ivanhoe Road in Edenthorpe. Um, it's presented to planning committee at the request of the request of Councillor Andrea Robinson um, following the receipt of objections from the neighbour opposite and from the parish council. Um, however, we do feel that a number of design amendments have now overcome any planning concerns, um, so there'd be no sound justification for refusal in our opinion. Um, so I'll quickly run through some pre-committee amendments first. Um, we have had an additional objection received from Paul Bissett, who's an Edenthorpe Parish Councillor, um, and that's really just echoing the same concerns uh, raised by uh, the Parish Council as a whole. Um, so uh, they can be summarised as the telegraph pole um, outside the site, uh, concerns about that limiting access, um, concerns about the size of the gardens, um, privacy with neighbouring occupiers, um, the lack of a front boundary hedge, and just a general uh, opinion that the development would be an overdevelopment of the plot. Um, we've also uh, added an additional Grampian condition um, to ensure that the supporting wire of the telegraph pole outside the site is removed before the development begins, um, and I will speak further about that later. Um, so I'll just briefly talk you through the map. Um, so this is the application site here. Um, it is uh, land to the north of 36 Ivanhoe Road, so the existing side garden would be subdivided. Um, there's a public footpath to the north, um, and there's also an electricity substation um, on the corner with that footpath, um, and there's a telegraph pole just outside that substation. Um, as you can see, the layout of the neighbourhood is predominantly made up of uniform pairs of semi-detached houses. Um, one exception is this bungalow opposite, um, which has been built in a similar infill plot um, to the side of number 37. What was that? This is the last... Um, can I ask, uh, can everyone hear me? got the microphone, can you put it on mute, apart from uh, Jacob, who's uh, speaking, please? We're picking up some background noise. Thank you, Chair. Sorry, I just wasn't sure if anyone was asking me to stop, but I'll just carry on, um, unless anyone's missed anything. Um, so... Yeah, these are just a couple of aerial views um, to show a bit more of the site context. So this is the site here. It's the, the substantial side garden. You can see the character of the street, um, sort of general suburban character. Um, in this aerial image, you can see the substation and the footpath a little bit better, um, and then the bungalow opposite as well. And just some street views. So this image shows the substation and the footpath uh, and the telegraph pole, which has a support wire um, coming just from the top down into the ground there. Um, this is number 36. So the proposed new pair of semi-detached houses would just sit next to it um, behind this boundary hedge. And that's just a view from the other side. And this is a bit of a context of the character of the street. So you can see it's a sort of natural gap in the street scene where another pair of semis would quite uh, logically fit in. Um, this existing site plan uh, just shows you again how substantial this garden is, so it can quite clearly accommodate um, some infill development there. And this site plan, um, as proposed, uh, you can see how the pair of semi-detached houses would fit into the pattern of development. It would sit behind the building line set by its immediate neighbours, uh, numbers 38 and 36, so it wouldn't be sticking out inappropriately on the street at all. I'm just zooming in on this site plan to discuss it in a little bit more detail. Um, so looking at the front, uh, you've got sufficient driveway space for two cars per house, um, which does meet with the council's parking guidelines um, and the dimensions of those driveways are perfectly acceptable. Um, the driveway layout has been amended to ensure a visibility splay of two metres by two metres for each car. So drivers can see properly when egressing from the site. Um, so we consider that now to be acceptable in terms of highway safety. The telegraph pole is shown here, this little dot on the site plan, um, and that doesn't pose a problem in terms of visibility or access. Um, however, the support wire, um, which I showed you on the previous picture, which leads down into the ground around here, um, could potentially be an obstruction if not moved. So what we've done to uh, deal with that is to add a Grampian condition, um, which states that no development can commence until the support wire has been relocated. Um, so that would require an agreement between the utility com uh, company and the applicant. 
Um, so the utility operate, operator would be the statutory undertaker and would probably charge the applicant for the works. But essentially, um, no building work can start until that's happened, um, until that wire has been relocated. And that's entirely um, enforceable. So this condition does it does ensure that there'll be no obstruction to that driveway. Um, you can also see the substation is retained and development wouldn't impact on that or on the uh, adjacent footpath. Um, looking at the rear, you can see both houses are served by a decent garden um, around about 60 square metres. Um, on the site plan, it's annotated at 62. Um, we measured it slightly less, um, more, more like around 57 square metres, and then there'd be a similar garden size retained next door as well. Um, so our South Yorkshire design guide states that 60 square metres would be the recommended guideline for three bedroom houses. Um, but you know, that's guidance rather than policy. And we think you know, it's basically around 60 square metres. If it's a couple below, um, then we wouldn't consider that to be a reason for refusal in itself, because there's clearly um, you know, a substantial outdoor amenity space there for each house. Um, the rear boundary of the houses would abut the garden area of 17 Ridgewood Avenue um, here. So the rear wall of the semi-detached houses would be located around seven metres from this boundary. Um, and as I'll explain later, the rear windows at first floor level would be obscure glazed with additional roof lights um, and they'd serve the bathrooms and smallest bedrooms on the first floor. Um, so because of that obscure glazing, there wouldn't be any overlooking of the neighbouring garden area. Um, and also it's worth noting that those neighbours haven't uh, submitted any objections to this proposal. Um, I'll just go back actually just to show you that there's a decent landscaping scheme at the front, which we've um, conditioned as well uh, to be uh, delivered in accordance with the planting details shown. Um, there would be uh, some trees felled and some vegetation removed. Um, and I understand that some of that has already happened. Um, unfortunately, none of the trees are protected and it's not a conservation area. So the council can't actually uh, prevent that vegetation or the trees from being removed anyway. Um, but what we have done is include a condition to provide an ecological enhancement plan um, within one month of the commencement of the development. Um, including measures such as attaching bird and bat boxes to the building. Um, so overall, the development's not considered to be harmful um, in terms of sort of biodiversity or wildlife. Um, and again, while it's this hedging that's currently there at the front does need to be removed to provide access, um, we do consider that the landscaping uh, scheme at the front, the planting would soften the appearance of the development. So the appearance would not be harmful. So just looking at the floor plans, um, we consider that these provide a good standard of accommodation. Um, both dwellings would exceed the nationally described space standard, as well as our own internal space standards. Um, there's built in storage provided and the layout has been amended so that the main bedrooms are at the front um, and then the bathroom and third bedrooms are at the rear, at the rear sorry, um, where, where there are obscure glazed windows. So the front bedrooms would have the best outlook. Um, as you can see from the proposed elevations, it's a very simple design, um, fitting in with the general architecture of the neighbourhood. Um, the materials would match surrounding dwellings, so you'd have red brick and red roof tiles. And this street scene just gives an impression of how it would look in relation to its neighbours. So you, you've got a fairly good separation between pairs of semi-detached houses. Um, it wouldn't be over densifying. The roof form would be matching, so we've had that amended as well so that it's more in keeping with the character. We've also had the design of the windows and the porches amended so that uh, they've got similar to, uh, proportions to the surrounding houses. And finally, I'll just show you um, this section drawing which explains how the glazing at the rear would work in the third bedrooms and bathrooms. Um, yeah. So you'd have obscure glazing um, up to a high level, which would be non-openable. So that means that residents wouldn't be able to look out onto neighbouring gardens, um, but the windows would still be letting in some light. Then the top of the windows would be clear glazed and you'd have additional roof lights providing a, a view of the sky as if it was like in, a, in an attic bedroom. 
Um, so that would result in rooms that have a good level of light while also protecting neighbour privacy. Um, so really in summary, um, we do think a pair of semi-detached houses is a logical infill development in this location. Um, the design would fit into the street scene and the access um, has been amended to ensure that it's completely safe. Um, and with the solution of the obscure windows and roof lights at the rear, um, we've made sure uh, that there's no impact on neighbouring amenity and that there's a good standard of amenity for the future occupiers of these houses as well, with the main bedrooms having the best outlook at the front. Um, so we feel that all those issues have been satisfactorily addressed. Um, so yeah, I'm happy to answer any questions. I do believe that Mr Green from the bungalow opposite is going to speak in opposition first there. Okay, thank you for that, Jacob. Okay, uh, Mr Green, local resident, has requested to speak in opposition to the application. This is now your opportunity to address the committee for up to five minutes. Please mute your microphone when you've concluded your submission. I will let you know when you've got one minute remaining. Would you like to commence, Mr Green? Hello, good afternoon, Chair. Can you hear me OK? I can, yes. Yeah. Right, um, I just wanted to point out first that we're not objecting to the development of this land, but to the overdevelopment of the land. Um, the, as Jacob has already said, the land is of comparable size to our land at number 35, which is a bungalow. However, the application land has reduced area due to an electrical substation in the northeast corner. The application land is also narrower than the number 35, as can be seen on aerial plans on Google. Parking pedestrian safety. The application land is unsuitable for two, three bedroom semi-attached houses due to the following reasons. The existing street scene is predominantly brick walls and hedgerows. The street scene after this, this development has been built will be cut, will as compromised because not one, but two open driveways to the property with four cars. So it's a totally open driveway. All the existing properties in the surrounding area have a boundary with a driveway. So this compromises the street scene as existing. <clears throat> Site plan CRB3 shows a parking width has been amended as well from five metres to 5.4. The ideal minimum width for two parked cars is six metres to 7.3 metres. This development increases the likelihood of two cars being parked on the road regularly due to constrained width as a result of the existing substation. What about access to wheelie bins, Royal Mail, etc.? This would increase risk of vehicles coming into conflict with many pedestrians who use the adjacent footpath due to hindered sighting. Looking at drawing CRB3, it is also noted that one of the adjacent driveways is in front of the left-hand side semi lounge window, and the other car overlaps the semi, which again is due to the constrained width. Note, the driveway should be wide enough to allow access to both sides of a parked car. Also, on one side, allow for pathway to the house. This width shall be no less than 3.2. A narrow driveway width of three metres may be acceptable where the driveway does not have to provide a pathway to the house. To put this into context, our driveway at number 35 is 2.6 metres wide. So to be realistic, we have to, the passenger has to, has to exit the car when we're parking our cars. So you can see by the size of the width on this plan that it won't be wide enough for two cars. The rear garden area is also very close to the minimum as Jacobs just pointed out. 60 meters square is the guidance. The majority of properties in the surrounding area have in, this, in excess of 120 meters squared. My conclusion is that the design has been compromised at the expense of the surrounding area. Another important requirement overlooking one minute, Chair. Doesn't, doesn't seem to be a considered. Got one minute remaining, Mr. Green. Thank you. Our bungalow has a bedroom, living room, facing development, which we compromised by the overlooking development. It would be more complementary to the pattern of the appearance of the streets than if a proposal mirrored the bungalow, as as ours 
across the road and would avoid any potential road safety issues which the compromised width of the driveway has will be imposing on this development. Thank you. Thank you for that, Mr Green. Thank Do you. we have any committee members that wish to ask Mr Green a question? Madam Chair. Thank you for that. As part of the debate, I will now ask the committee members to indicate by raising their hand if they wish to comment on the report or ask the planning case officer a question. I've got showing one, but I can't see who it is. Councillor Cooper, Councillor Healy and Councillor Hogarth, Chair. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Cooper. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, my main point here is really to uh, comment on one of the paragraphs for chapter 9.26, uh, where it actually says, according to representations by a neighbour, trees have already been removed. Whilst this is regrettable, the site is not in a conservation area and the trees are not protected by a tree preservation order. Therefore, there is no planning mechanism to prevent the felling of trees or removal of vegetation on site. And this could occur even if the development were not granted permission. Well, yeah, that's the case, Chair. But I have to ask Jacob, where are we using the preservation orders when these sites are flagged up? If they're a tree? It might well be that the trees on site were not worthy of a new preservation order, but surely the planning preserva the preservation orders is a first line of defence to slap a preservation order on any trees on a site if they're deemed to be in danger. You know, that's completely false. Chapter 9.26, we have the preservation orders and officers should utilise that if they think they're going to be removed to facilitate or an advanced strike on a site. You know, Jacob, you have to take that into account. That's a false statement. That's flagging up to developers that can basically do what they want. Anyway, Chair. Uh, thank I'd you. Like... I would say thank you for that, Councillor Cooper. We don't know when they will remove those trees, so it would, it might not be possible, but uh, I think uh, the planning case officers will know that if we have an application, come to maybe check the trees on site first before... Like I accept state. that, Chair, but that's giving developers ideas in that paragraph. It's wrong. It's, it's wrongly worded. Okay, thank you for that, Councillor Cooper. Councillor Healy. Yes, thank you, Chair. Sorry about that. It, the arrow goes everywhere. Right. Um, paragraph 913, talking about policies uh, 1 to 5 of the draft in Thorpe uh, Neighbourhood Plan, uh, place an emphasis on providing sufficient outdoor garden space. I'm not going to read it all, Chair. It, it, because it has been given low weighting because it hasn't yet been uh, approved yet as the Edenthorpe local plan. However, uh, we've got it within the local plan um, as well, as I understand it. But that's not the point. We've recognised that the garden size is slightly smaller, but we, we've uh, also agreed, uh, or the authority will be going down the line of saying um, it's OK. The query I've got, uh, and I know someone's going to turn around and say, well, that's not relevant, is that once somebody buys the house, right, and we're talking about garden space, and we're trying to enshrine that in the local plan and, uh, uh, and uh, the neighbourhood local plans like Edenthorpe, etc., right, but you've got permitted development rights, which if I remember rightly, is it three or three and a half metres I can do an extension? So take that away from the garden space that's there now, whether it's 60 or 57, you're reducing it even further. And uh, you might the argument might be, well, we can't look into the future. The problem I have, Chair, is this, is that it... I agree with uh, uh, the gentleman that spoke earlier who's in opposition uh, over development. I'd be quite happy if there was a bungalow there. I, I mean, I'm again, not uh, uh, against development. And I believe that was already put to the uh, applicant. And, uh, and I'm wondering if committee could persuade the officers to go back to the uh, applicant to try and persuade uh, for a, a, a bungalow based on this on the fact that once you start developing what's already developed albeit not you but somebody else that garden goes out the window there's going to be no space i know it's not relevant chair but 
in my own backyard, not exactly where I live, but developments that did 30 years ago. People have developed the homes because they weren't big enough. There's no garden anymore. No garden. And I, it, it, to me, that's over development. OK, thank you for that, Councillor Uh Jonathan, you've got your hand up. Are you wanting to come in, Jonathan? Uh, yes, please, if I may. Yeah, just revisiting um, the paragraph 9.26 that Councillor Cooper mentioned. Having reread it, I, I can understand why it sounds a bit brutal, but it is factually correct. And in defence of uh, Jacob, and it is regrettable, we've got, we have got no mechanism on pre-application uh, site clearance, I'm afraid. So in reports, I have to brutally ref reflect that fact. And I, I disagree that this uh, is in, in any way would encourage developers to clear sites. It's just a, a factual statement. I just wanted to, to, to state that. Is, is that OK? That's uh, thank fine. You. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank, uh, thank you, Chair. Roy, we've got, you're welcome. Roy. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, and I'll come back and answer or attempt to answer Councillor Healy's question, if, if I may. Uh, uh, just in, in in relation to the first point, if you look at condition three of the planning approval, uh, should permission be granted, uh, there is a condition there that's restricting or removing permitted development rights from this uh, application. So what would that would mean is that if somebody does want to do any kind of extension or outbuilding that would normally be deemed to be permitted development, it will require a planning application and we can then give consideration to that in terms of the loss of any amenity stroke garden area. So uh, we are we are alive to the the, the, the real concern that you've raised there, Councillor Healy. Oh, in, thanks, Roy, I missed that. Yeah, no, no worries. That's what we're here for, to assist the uh, councillor. Uh, in, in relation to the other query about us going away and asking to uh, explore about the possibility of a bungalow, unfortunately, that's not within our gift. What we have to do here today as a planning committee is determine the application on its merits. Uh, so although, you know, the, the neighbour has uh, put forward his, his concerns, it isn't just to say, could you please withdraw your application and put in an application for a bungalow? We've got to determine the application before us. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for that, Roy. OK, Councillor Hogarth. Yeah, it's just a couple of things. Uh, the garden size, you know, the garden size, the 60 square metres or whatever, I thought that would be a minimum. So this is going to be less than the minimum required. Could I, one question, can I ask why we have this minimum size if we think it's too big? And the other thing is, I know it's in flood zone one, but why don't we on these covers say, well, instead of block paving, have a porous uh, car park area and a porous uh, patio so the water can get away and we're not just using all the uh, land drainage area up so that it will end up becoming blood on two and three thank you for that charlie jacob yeah um i can answer that so on the first point um so that was about the garden sizes so um the <coughs> design guide has the status <coughs> of an spd um, rather than policy. So it's used to guide the uh, interpretation, implementation, uh, implementation rather of policies. Um, so it is set out as, an, as a minimum, um, but I think looking at the planning balance, um, if a garden falls just a couple of square metres below that 60, we've got to look at whether that's harmful enough to recommend refusal. And I think in this case, you're delivering um, two new dwellings, which the NPPF supports as a presumption of in favour of sustainable development, and it's a natural infill plot. And, you know, looking at the plans, you can see that there's enough space for a family to enjoy an outdoor garden area. So the fact that it's sort of two square metres under um, or three square metres, we consider that's not, you know, in the balance of considerations, that's not a shortfall that would be enough to recommend refusal on its own. Um, with the driveway, um, you can get permeable or uh, porous types of block paving, I do believe. Um, and there are conditions, um, there are highways conditions for the site surfacing um, and also a drainage condition. Um, so they're pre-commencement. Um, so details of the driveway and the drainage would be submitted uh, prior to development commencing. 
um, to make sure that that's all done properly and doesn't cause any drainage issues. Thank you for that, Jacob. Uh, Councillor Hogarth, do you have a supplementary question? Yeah, just what's the reason for having a minimum if we're not going to adhere to it? There must be a reason why that 60 is a minimum size. I'm sure it's not to help developers or it might, 60 might have been a minimum to help developers, but we're going further by, oh, well, I, instead of 60, we'll have it at 58. Yes, I think I, think I answered what... that question. I, I suppose I'd just say again that it's it's about balancing the considerations and I suppose the reason that there is a minimum is that, you know, we want to promote a good amount of outdoor garden space. Um, but when you look at the development as a whole, we would consider that there is enough space here um, and there's also enough internal space. So as a whole, when you look at the actual policies, which would be CS1 um, and CS14 in terms of residential amenity, we do think it is compliant. OK, thank you for that, Jacob. Is there anyone else wishing to ask a question, Councillor Cooper? Councillor Cooper. Sorry. He came off mute chair and then he's back, back on mute. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know what, okay. what happened there, uh, Stacey. I didn't touch it. Um, yeah, I would have to ask Jacob, does he think there's sufficient room on this site for two dwellings uh, for the proposed landscaping, which seems wholly inadequate to me? Does he think that the landscape provided is going to provide any shade onto that building? Because we're sure on in two buildings onto a very small site and there's no way you can stop the reflected heat off it. And that's got to be one of the purposes of the landscaping. You know, we're not going to, there is a policy somewhere that says we should be re requiring high quality landscaping. Do you think that what's been provided or your experts here today that it's high quality landscaping? Is there sufficient room for that, Jacob? Um, yes, I, I believe that the site is big enough to accommodate two dwellings with landscaping. Um, in terms of uh, heat, um, and shading, you know, the, the way that the houses are orientated, it's not got south facing glazing, it's only got uh, east and west facing glazing. So I don't think you'd be at too much risk of solar glare or overheating. Um, so yeah, I would say that um, while the site is constrained, it can accommodate two dwellings. Okay, thank you. Jacob, do you have a supplementary question, Councillor Fulper? Yeah, well, I was just going to say uh, I don't agree with that, Chair, but um, I'll bow to what Jacob's saying, but I think it's something we need to consider in the future about this. Um, we, we've had this a few times, Chair, where the gardens have been less than what our uh, policies require, uh, and every time it's, it's the lesser requirement that wins. It's time we started making a stand. Um, anyway, okay, that, that's thanks. all I'll say. Thanks, Chair. All right, thank thanks, you. Jacob. Uh, Chair, I've got my hand up. May I, whilst we're on the issue of landscape? All right, sorry, it's out. not it's not showing on my... Uh... I don't know, I've not done it yet. Would it, is it oh. all right to discuss this while we're on this issue? Because I think Councillor Cooper's got some um, valid points. Yep. Oh, is that please, all right? Okay. Share the screen. It's fine, love, yeah. Thank you. Um, right. Councillor Cooper, I'm just looking for the landscape scheme. On my, to share my screen. Thanks, John. Can you see that? <clears throat> it's just load of grasses and. Um, I've got I've got part of it, Jonathan. I can't see the planet got, itself. I'll, I'll zoom out. I've read. Is it all right if I read read out to you what they are? Then I'll zoom out and see where they're being dotted around. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> Formium. This is more for, for Councillor Cooper. Is that all right, everyone? Thank you. Formium, Hebe, Autumn Glory, Hosta, Magnolia Grandiflora, they, they might be right in terms of size. White Pearl, Actius, Matsumari, Acorus, Golden Delight, Acanthus, Mollis, Tasmanian Angel, Viburnum Winter, Camellia Japonica. They, they'll be quite nice. So if does this move with, uh, with me, this screen? Yeah, yeah. That's, John, yeah, that's so fine. Basically, all them little shrubs are dotted. Yeah. So it's not much. Yeah. No, it's not Jonathan, is it? However, having said that, I'll share street scene with you as well. 
look look at that right in the street scene marvelous yeah yeah could, oh can you see the street scene no it's just showing up. right i'll show it to you and this is a bugbear we have about garden hedges uh whilst i share my screen two seconds um and just while you're doing that as well john i do notice that there are some trees that are also being planted yeah we can discuss house. them yeah. as well yeah okay. so we did more we're on that um street view yeah they on the street scene that looks marvelous doesn't it yeah and it's just going to be car parking now yeah however yeah. the only the only legal restrictions that apply to the protection of hedges are the hedgerow regulations so domestic hedges like these are explicitly exempt so people yeah. can people can take them out anyway yeah irrespective of planning regrettably so that's how it is so that's how we have to take it on the chin about the removal of these features in the street scene yeah yeah right i'm afraid in the terms of the trees that appear to have come out it's these two golden cypress which we wouldn't have tpo'd really i don't think in a garden context but more concerningly would be, would have been the pine but looking at that street view it looks like it's a bit browning anyway mm -hmm. And a bit, maybe a bit sparse in the canopy. So again, on balance, the, the preemptive clearance is one again. We're probably going to have to take on the chin. But it, the, the relandscaping is certainly not a replacement for what's lost. But it's whether how much weight landscaping. Um, so how many how many of the uh, Himalayan birch and the ornamental plums are going back in, Jonathan? Is it just one of each? Well, I, I'm not too sure. Oh, what? Well, let's see. We want to go back to the. Yeah, uh, it listed those two species, John, but uh, Which one is it eight? didn't. I don't Sorry. think it said how many. Of course. I've, I've got it. Cal Sorry, Chair, it's Roy, but I've got it calculated that there are four uh, Himalayan birch and two plum trees oh that's okay, okay yeah, some, some, somebody has to make comment on the ornamental plum trees roy because the, the, they'll just rip everything up in sight the footpaths the block paving walls they'll just destroy everything in sight they should be substituted with something else it's just a nonsense planting them in a small enclosed garden like that i'm not too sure there are plum trees there i'm trying to find the scheme again oh i got here it is Purple leaf plum. Do you think it's do you think it's oh, feasible, Jonathan, to plant that species? I don't, not in a small garden. I, so oh a tree schedule, where are they? T one and T two. Sorry, I've missed them. Um Yeah, I don't want to be getting into too much fine detail when it's down to landscape architects, Jonathan. I I think, I say. Yeah, it's got it's got lawn to grow into. Yeah. And it has got a planting strip. If you're taking out as many as I taken out, Jonathan, in a small garden for the damage it's caused, you certainly won't recommend it, mate. But anyway, I'll leave the fine detail to you. Okay, thank you for that, Jonathan. Thank you for that. Thank you, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank Chair, you. Chair, can I just ask? Can I just ask that we we have a, a seminar in the future to discuss the use of preservation orders with Roy. We really need to discuss this about safeguards in the future. And I know there's a vast resource implication here. But the TPOs, new TPOs, are the only way to protect the treescape from potential development. I'm not saying they should be used to stop development, but they are a safeguard. And I know with a local plan that all build, major building sites will be identified in that. So we'll know where people are going to build and what's on them. But okay, you know, small sites are going to continue to come up, Chair. All right. Thank you, Background Support. I'm sure that's something I will take on board and organise for the Thanks, future. Roy. Thank you for that. <coughs> okay. Thanks, Jonathan, for your comments, else, mate. Okay. Is there anybody else wishing to ask the question? Or can I go through to the recommendation now? Okay, I'm going to read out the recommendation. Is there a proposal to grant planning permission? Can I ask the committee member moving and seconding the motion to identify themselves when speaking? Is there a mover for the recommendation? I'm happy to move it. Do we have a seconder for the recommendation? I'll second it, Chair Steve Cox. Okay, so it's been seconded by Councillor Steve Cox. 
I will now ask each member individually if they are for or against the motion or if they wish to abstain. Councillor McGuinness? Against, Joe. Councillor Anderson? Against, Joe. Councillor Beach? Against, Joe. Councillor Coulter? Is there Councillor Cooper? Sorry, Chair, against. Thank you. Councillor Cox? For, Chair. Councillor Hughes? Against, Chair. Councillor Healy? Against, Chair. Councillor Hoggart? Against, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Pickering. Against, Chair. Councillor Wood. I'm against as well, Chair. OK, thank you for that. But so, uh, planning permission hasn't been granted. Um, voting, and I Chair. Have, I have um, moved it. So, yes, I'm going to vote in favour. Um, we now need an alternative. Motion for the reason we're not granting permission. <laughs> Do we have a hand up, Iris, Council Beach? Yeah, um, I think it's overdevelopment on, on that plot. <coughs> And also that it um, doesn't fit in with the street scene. OK, so Council Beach has moved to reject the application for overdevelopment and not fitting in with the street scene, the characteristics of the area. Is that correct? Chair, Chair, can I ask Councillor Beach just to elaborate slightly on that? I just want to understand what she means when she says it doesn't fit into the street scene. Uh, yes, that's uh, Stacey um it just doesn't so to sudden to have a nice green hedge and suddenly probably possibility of the back ends of four cars and then more nice green hedge um it just just spoils the the whole look of the thing I, I would uh, just come back on that that point there that if this is uh, yeah. about the hedge the hedge row uh, chair you've heard from John Tesh just a short while ago that that hedgerow could be removed tomorrow and we could do nothing about it under the hedgerow mm -hmm. regulation so that wouldn't be any defense should this application proceed towards an appeal thank you sorry <laughs> okay so councillor beach well oh you've got over development yeah and regarding not fitting with the street then based on what's been said yeah Councillor Cooper wants to come in. He can probably uh, elaborate on my. <laughs> I, I can't okay, remember what. Well, I, I don't agree that the landscaping is particularly high quality. Um, it can obviously be subjective, but I would say that there's a national policy planning framework number on that. I can't remember which one it is, where it says we are allowed to require high quality landscape, and I don't think that's high quality landscape because I just don't think there's room for it. You know, when I know how weak planning conditions are, once those trees are in and the shrubs are in, there's nothing we can do to stop those being taken out. So at this stage, I would say that um, it's one of the MPPF numbers, but I can't remember which one. Uh, I've okay, so right. are you I think happy we're then? just looking for that for you, um, Councillor Cooper. I think Roy's looking at something at the moment. Hopefully he's looking for the MPPF number. Um, I'd be happier with, um, lack of quality landscaping and overdevelopment that I would be with uh, the street scene uh, reason that Councillor Beach suggested. Okay, so Councillor Beach, That's... are you happy with the uh, overdevelopment yes. and the lack of quality landscaping as the reason for rejecting the application? Yes. That's I, don't know, I don't know if Roy's got anything to add on that, Roy. Um, I've just uh, flicked forward to the appeal decisions, and if we look at the, uh, there's some useful reference there on the landscape in one, Stacey, uh, the, the uh, millstone. I think it mentions paragraph 127, 
uh, where uh, the MPPF stipulates, amongst other things, that decisions should ensure that developments will function well and add to the overall quality of the area, not just for the short term, but over the lifetime of the development. So I, I would say it's paragraph 127 of the MPPF. Yeah. yeah. Paragraph 127 of the MPPF. Thank you. Do we have a second for the motion? Oh, I'll, 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 yeah. Okay, so I'm going to go through everybody again. Okay, so, um, Councillor McGuinness? For the motion, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Anderson? For it, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Beach? For it, Chair. Councillor Cooper? For it, Chair. Councillor Cox? Abstaining. Okay, thank you for that. Councillor Hughes? I'm for the motion. Thank you, Councillor Healy. For the motion, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Hoggart. For the motion, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Pickering. For the motion, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Wood. For the motion, Chair. Thank you, and I'll abstain so that the planning permission has been rejected. Okay, on to item number five, a planning application 20 oblique 02321 oblique COU for the change of use from a dwelling to two self contained flats at 10 Baxter Avenue, Wheatley, Doncaster. And I'm going to invite Mark Ramsey, the planning case officer, to introduce this item. Over to you, Mark. You're still on mute, Mark. Are we able to unmute Mark, please? Can't, Jerry. He has to unmute himself. He yeah, might have to log off and log back on. Yeah, sorry, my connection oh, just dropped there. Okay, all right, I'll try again. We can hear you now. OK, yeah, it all fell apart when I tried to launch the PowerPoint. OK. Right, OK, can you see the PowerPoint? Hello, has it gone no. up again? Oh, dear. We've yes, got Mark. it now, we've yes, got Mark. it now, Mark. Yeah. We've got it now, okay. yes. Right, OK, right. To, right. OK, thank you, Chair. Thank you for your patience, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, this application is for the conversion of a mid terrace house in Wheatley to two flats. It's being presented to a uh, committee as the applicant is a Doncaster councillor uh, for the Bessic Award. Uh, the application has been publicised by the sending letters to neighbouring nearby properties and listed on the council website and no representations have been received. The site is within the main urban area and designated in the unit tree development plan and emerging local plan as allocated within a residential policy area. As you see from the map, it's in a single block of terrace properties running from Highfield Road up to Beckett Road, with a more modern muse style development opposite. In the overhead photograph, you can see that the street scene the street is characterised by two storey. Excuse me. Uh, by two storey semis with red brick frontage, sorry, it's two storey uh, terrace properties with red brick frontage, ground floor bay windows with, uh, which project out or of the otherwise flat frontages and red or grey pantile roofs. And I'll just highlight where we are looking, which I've done. So if you look from the rear, it can be seen that there are projecting gables which are split between the adjoining properties and small yards that back onto the alleyway that runs along the backs of Baxter Avenue and also serves the backs, backs of properties fronting St Mary's Road. Again, I'll just pop an arrow in so I know which one uh, we're referring to. 
And for completeness, there is an image of the front of number 10. There are not proposed to be any alterations to the frontage and from a search of historic applications, I could only find one other conversion on this street. Therefore, it's not considered to make a significant change of character, either through appearance or in terms of use. And a couple of single bed flats will contribute to the mix of housing available in the locality. The site is also a relatively short distance from shops on Beckett Road and approximately half a mile from the town centre, so it's consi considered to be a sustainable location. It is also about the same distance to the uh, Doncaster College hub. Onto the plans. Externally, there are no changes to the front and the rear facing elevations other than making good some detailing, which would not normally require planning consent. Internally, there will uh, be a shared hallway served by the existing uh, the, the existing front door uh, leading to a stairwell which will access the uh, flat above. The internal space standards for the two single bed flats are met and considered adequate. The only other alteration would be a window in the side facing elevation for the respective kitchen areas. Uh, there's potential for overlooking from the upper level window highlighted on the plan, so a condition requiring it to be obscure glazed would be appropriate given it is a secondary window to the existing rear facing window. The bins are collected from the rear alleyway, so provision will be required for storage area before the flats are brought into use, and that can be required by condition. There's no off street parking, but there are no restrictions on on street parking, and the likely comings and goings are likely to be similar to that of a single dwelling. Also, due to the sustainable lo location, no objections have been raised by the highways officer to the proposed change. So, in summary, the proposal is considered in the context of the presumption in favour of sustainable development. Development would create two one-bed flats, adding to the mix of accommodation available in the surrounding area in a sustainable location without harmfully impacting upon residential amenity. Subject to the conditions proposed, the proposal is recommended for the grant of planning permission. Okay, have I? I've been talking to myself. Oh, flipping egg. No, Mark. Yeah, you Mark. Mark. No. Sorry, did you hear that? <laughs> I've been talking to myself yes. again. Yeah, we just need to say thank you. <laughs> All right, thank you. <laughs> thank, thank you, you Mark. No problem. Thank you, Mark. Okay, as part of the debate, I'm going to ask the committee members to indicate by raising their hand if they wish to comment on the report or ask the planning case officer a question. Okay, there's nothing showing on there. Okay, Mark just uh, needs will... to stop sharing his yep. screen. Um, that's all. Yeah, just trying to find the right. <laughs> Apologies. Um, don't don't know where that's. Where I've been doing that. Sorry, Chair. I think we need some IT training here. <laughs> <laughs> you get escape button works. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, Chair, would it would it upset you if I said that Mark Ramsey was actually one of our IT experts in the <laughs> plan? <department? laughs> so, uh, <laughs> it's gone. I, I, probably I, I need to leave and rejoin to get get it to go. I think that um, was that was yesterday, Roy. Just, <laughs> yeah, indeed. <coughs> Time moves on. Uh, right, I shall. Okay, we'll give him a chance to rejoin. It's done, Chair, it's, got, it's gone. Right, okay. Um, I did ask, and nobody said that they didn't say they had any questions, so I'm going to read out the recommendation within the report. Is there a proposal to grant planning permission? Eva Hughes, yes, I will uh, propose that. Uh, Cyrus, I'll second it. OK, that's brilliant. I will now ask each member individually if they wish to vote for or against the motion or if they wish to abstain. Sound for McGuinness? Four, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Anderson? Four, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Beach? Four, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Cooper? Four, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Cox? Four, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Hughes? You're on mute, Councillor Hughes. 
Sorry, I'm four chair. Thank you. Councillor Healy? Four chair. Councillor Hogarth, thank you. Four chair. Thank you. Councillor Pickering? Four chair. Thank you. Councillor Wood? Yes, I'll just give you the chance to make it unanimous as well, though, Chair. Ooh. OK, yeah, and I support the application as well. So the recommendation is agreed and the application has been granted. OK, so item six is the appeal decision. This report is for information only. Does any member wish to speak on the item at all? Yeah, Chair, I would just say that in the relation to the appeal that we lost on the uh, the property in Tickhill, um, which I know Roy, I'm sure, will give us a, a, a lesson on in a moment. Um, there was a, 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 um, a shadow of light or a, a silver lining in that quite clearly the applicant also appealed for costs and was refused on costs. And uh, the inspector made specific comment of the fact that whilst he is, uh, he sorry, he or she are, uh, well, actually it wasn't inspector, I think it was a senior planning appeals officer, that whilst they were cognitive that the decision would be against that of the planning committee, that he recognised that we had clearly done a decent job of chewing it over and looking at policies and uh, and and obviously that you know I think the officers are, are to be commended on clearly passing that on to the um, to the, the the inspecting officer if that's the right word, but uh, it, you know it does it does underline what officers do tell us that you know if we discuss these things well that there's no harm in having a separate answer, um, but you know clearly it, that happened in this case and you know it's unfortunate that our office. Our, our answer was different, but it, do, it you know, I would underline that I, I hope officers noticed that the, uh, you know, that the inspecting officer made those comments because quite clearly, you know, I, I think we do a good job as a committee. Okay, thank you for that, Councillor. Councillor Cooper. Thanks, Chair. Well, I have to say it's good on the cost. But just as the inspector got it wrong and quoted the wrong document on the large mature poplar at Ascombe when they got to the wrong British standard, and I did ask that to be pursued because he quoted the British standard in that 1992 when it had actually been revised in 2005 and 2012. And I would like to see the outcome of any issues when that was raised with the inspector when it got wrong. They've got it wrong on this occasion because in uh, paragraph nine, it says the location of the proposed edge and spacing of trees around the periphery of the parking area would provide an attractive backstop to the yard standing, when in fact you won't see the edge. The inspector's misinterpreted the plan, I would say, and that he's got the edge on this side, when in fact it's not. It's on the other side of the car park where he split it. So therefore the inspector's got it wrong, and that's a huge part of the problem of the evidence that was submitted. And that should be raised with the inspector again, because it provides no green backdrop, and the trees will not provide any backdrop for a long, long time. So the main thing that was going to provide the greenery in the car park was the edge. And he's misinterpreted it, Chair. And that wants raising with the inspectorate. Thank right, you Chair. for that comment. Thank you. Right, I'll apply for a job as an inspector. Else? Uh, uh, will, sorry, Chair. Sorry. Will, will Roy obviously be able to comment on that? I mean, it, it was... It, it was an irony that, that when we looked at this application, it was really only when we got into the detail that even ourselves realised that the carpet, that the car park was being significantly split. You know, that that wasn't immediately obvious. And it, and it is a sensible question to say to, you know, the, 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 the inspecting officer, uh, you know, are you aware that when you went and had a look that actually all of the hard standing that you saw is not what was is going to be there that literally it was only going to be two thirds or a half of that i mean it is is is, is it are we able to confirm that in well, any we'll way we'll just check with that council because obviously the report is down for noting not for action so i'm sure either roy or stacy will be able to tell us whether we are able to just provide some feedback uh I don't know. We, we we never have done as far as I'm 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 uh, as, as far as I'm aware. Uh, I think I think the points that I'm taking away from this, and I was going to go through them very briefly. Uh, oh, sorry, my computer's calling. Uh, 
is that the takeaway point from this were, were two things from for me, and this is in relation to the millstone. There was the landscaping and there was the highway issues, and they, that was the reason the application was refused. And in relation to the landscaping, it's a subjective matter. Uh, and, you know, uh, the planning committee came up with their decision, which was contrary to the officer's decision. Quite, as you've mentioned, Councillor Wood, planning committee members are entitled to come to a different uh, view. It's your role as the decision taker to, to do that. Uh, and the inspector who is independent has looked at this. They will have site visited it. We've put forward our case. The appellants put forward their case. They've looked at it in the round and they've come up with the conclusion on the information that's been presented that they feel that the landscaping proposed is satisfactory. As I've said, it's subjective and I could argue till I'm blue in the face uh, and I won't convince somebody when something is so subjective like that. So there is there, there is a, an issue there. Uh, and, and then the other thing on the highway standards, it's quite interesting to note that the inspector is saying that when we talk about things like parking standards, He's picked up on that these are maximum parking standards uh, and, all, our, and given that the parking proposed here didn't meet the maximum standards, uh, regardless, it, you know, it looked to in terms of the harm and what everybody in terms of consultation responses and our case and what the appellant has put forward uh, and has come up with a, with a different conclusion. So I don't think there's any reason that we could really kind of argue this with the, uh, the the planning inspector the planning permission is, is granted now but I don't know if Stacey you've got any anything to feed in on that in terms of process and procedure yeah I think you, there's a way of uh, challenging a, a planning inspector decision if you think that the inspectors made a legal error um, but I don't think that's necessarily what we're saying here I think as I understand it Councillor Cooper is just saying that um, that the, the inspector's decision implies that the the hedge will be uh, sort of uh, uh, facing the car park rather than behind the fence. Well, it is Stacey is referring to it and providing um, what, what's his word? We're providing an attractive soft edge to the build the location of the proposed edge and spacing of trees or blah 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 would provide an attractive backdrop. Well, it won't stay safe. It's behind the fence. We agreed at the meeting that the fence was either 1.8 to 2 metres high, so you're not going to see the edge. He's misinterpreted the plan just like many of us did in the original application stage. And it was Jonathan Wood that picked up on it at the time that the edge was actually on the other side because we questioned the ownership of that piece of land and the applicant at the time wouldn't say whether it was theirs or not. And they had to go away because um, the question was asked, how can they say that an edge is going to be planted on the other side of that fence if they don't know who owns the land? And it actually came back that they still own the land, I believe. It, and it was, it, sorry to, sorry, it sorry to interrupt, Mick. It wasn't even to the extent that it was the other side of the of the existing boundary. The boundary is going to be moved yes. in and yes. carved onto the existing car park. And I think I think that's the that's the, the easy misinterpretation. And it's not that anybody's miss. It's just a simple error that you've got to realize that when you stand in that car park, you think you're standing in the car park and you're looking at the boundary of the development. At that point, you're not. Because if you're standing in any of the existing car parking spaces that are against the existing boundary, you're actually in somebody else's garden at that point. You know, Jonathan, it, you know, everything you say is valid. And even more so that this wants this wants raising with the inspector because do it on one side, you do it on another. I'm not saying that the inspector's not up to the job, but I'm saying, like you would say, it's a valid mistake. But if they make that mistake once, don't make it again. That could have been, that. I believe that was key uh, to the landscaping. That edge was the biggest piece of landscaping on this site. And we argued that rigorously at the applications when we discussed it. But anyway, we can go on forever on that. I believe the inspector's made a mistake, and I would like to see a letter sent off to the inspector about that. You know, I, think I, there, I think there is a way that we can contact the inspector to alert them if we've got concerns over a decision rather than making a, a sort of appeal to the High Court on in terms of a legal I'm, error. I'm, I don't think I'm, we're in the we're not, of that here. I know we're not going to do that, Stacey, but I just want the point making. We've had this, you know, we had this. I asked for the inspector to be informed that they used a standard that was 20 years out of date on that Askin site. Had he looked at the 2012 edition, there is no way he would have said what he said about that tree if he'd read the up-to-date edition. You know, we're talking an inspector um, making key decisions here, and he'd used a 20-year-old blooming document on the Ascom one, and this guy's made a genuine mistake. So anyway, um, I don't want to draw so, this meeting sorry, out. Sorry, sorry. Stacey, is that, is, is that a reasonable um, 
sort of state of yeah. affairs then just to write to him as a as an informal letter to say yeah. look just to be absolutely clear we've read your decision in detail and it, it leads us to the conclusion that there's still some confusion here you know be clear in mr inspector the the hedge that you are talking about is not on the site and it doesn't mark the boundary of the site because it's only going to be delivered through this i, I think the term was grampian condition and, and of course, the car park that you've seen there in situ is, you know, w just confirm that you are aware that a third of it is going to be carved off and become part of a separate property unit. Because I, I, I do think that is crucial to the understanding. Yeah, okay. I'll check what the mechanism is. Yeah, I'll check what the mechanism is, Councillor, for alerting pins when when this slightly misleading information here. I don't think we are, though, in the realms of challenging the, the legality of the decision. I don't think it would necessarily change the outcome, but I'll certainly look into what the mechanism would be and report back to you councillors about that. Okay. Yeah, Stacey, I, you know, I, I know we're not going to make a full challenge here, but the statement needs to be made that Doncaster is picking up on these things in its planning section. You know, and they're not going to second. They're not going to. They're not going to settle for second best when mistakes, technical mistakes, are made that could be quite crucial to the outcome of an inspector's decision. You know, it doesn't. Okay. It does need signalling, Stacey. The, the other point I'll make here, Stacey, it, it's the fact is as well, and I, I check this out. The Department of Environment used to employ eight regional arboriculturalists, and they used to be called in where there were trees or landscaping issues. And I think it's the case, and I've said this before, that he actually binned those eight consultants and reverted back to um, like building traditional architects or whoever as their expert people. I think they actually got rid of the expert arboriculturalists. Whether that's true or not, I keep meaning to look that up because I have quite a few friends who work right. for the inspectorate. Thank anyway, you there we go. Sorry to interrupt. Okay. Uh, apologies, but I've got to leave the meeting. Okay. okay. Thank you, Councillor McGuinness. Okay, uh, so therefore we're going to ask the committee to move that the report be noted and Stacey's going to take away to look and see what we can do regarding uh, some concerns raised about the accuracy um, within the statement. Um, are we happy with that noted? Yeah, yeah, just, just as long as she does right if that's okay and feeds back to us not not just think about it can we thank all the officers so, chair can we thank all the officers yeah i've, thank I've you, given some a hard husband. time <laughs> <laughs> i wouldn't expect anything else from the account of the Good, oh, i'm glad my standards aren't dropping <laughs> Good. okay so members ladies and gentlemen that concludes the business at today's meeting thank you for attending and i'd like to thank everyone for their attendance and input and i now declare the meeting concluded thank you everybody thank, thank you, you. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.